Yes, no more ground that we're not using it today. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, you are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Business and Culture Committee to be held in the Chamber, Yaltol Dairy, on Tuesday, the 8th of September, 2020, at 4 p.m. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Gillespie to record attendance and apologies. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Raymond Barr. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Mr. Michael Cooper. Mr. Michael Cooper. 
Councillor Shona Cusack. Uh, Councillor Mary Durgan. Councillor Rory Farrell. Councillor Rachel Ferguson. Alderman Darren Guy. Councillor Patricia Loeb. Councillor Anne McCluskey. <laughs> Councillor Eddie Mellon, uh, Alderman David Ramsey. No? <laughs> hey, hey, it's well seen since the first day back at school. Uh, Alderman Graham Work. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to read out the, the broadcasting statement. Um, I would like to remind everyone uh, who is in attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be made available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. Uh, this broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to be filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council's website. Um, next item on the agenda is declarations of members' interests. Anyone? Councillor Ferguson? I'm not sure whether it has to be declared, but item number 14 refers to the lag, which I'm part of. Alderman Mark. No one else? Okay. Uh, next item is we have a deputation uh, from the Straban Historical Society. And with us today are Mr. Pat McGuigan uh, and Mr. Gordon Smith. Uh, you're very welcome to the Council Chamber. Um, you now have 10 minutes uh, to make your presentation uh, to the members. And the members will then have 10 minutes to provide comment and feedback. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just before I start, I would like to thank a number of other people that uh, assisted us in getting to this point and where we're at regarding Mulltown House. So uh, uh, we'd like to thank the councillors, uh, mainly from the Sparrow Ward. Uh, we we haven't had the time or the the mileage to go around everybody, but uh, we're hoping that this will be the start of a, a conversation or a start of a process that we want uh, to happen. Uh, we'd also like to thank thank other members of the Straban History Society because I, I could see he's been handed out copies of uh, Straban Grammar School proposal for Heritage Visitor Centre. So unfortunately, and I know you will be disappointed in this, you just wanted to get this early so that you could have a good read of it. But uh, you will be able to, what we're going to do today is to just summarize some of the issues that are in this. But then, you, as I say, down at the bottom of this, it says, submitted on behalf of Straban History Society. Sorry for a correction, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's History Society as opposed to Historical Society, but I'm not going, I, I agree with what you say anyhow. And, uh, an, an interested party. So there's more than just the Straban history that's involved in this. There are other interested people within the, the Straban and the wider area. So our main purpose today is to put forward our proposal to transform Milltown House and Lodge and part of the site therein into a heritage or visitor center to allow the story of Straban area to be told. Uh, we require guidance on how to achieve this in a viable and successful way, and that's why we require the council to give us guidance and to show us the way and to lead the way and 
you know, we'll do this in partnership. We understand that we will require funding and goods and goodwill from many sources, but we feel confident that a heritage visitor centre is very much not only needed, but is welcome in Straban. Uh, the, the, the important thing about it is that we feel that the story of Straban has not been told by anyone, and this will be the start of it. You know, uh, every town, every village, every city like yourselves have a story to tell. So this is the beginning of our story here. Uh, we have a great history, and uh, up to now we've lost quite a number of iconic buildings. And uh, whenever we heard rumours to the effect that Milltown was being vandalised and was maybe going to be knocked down, we were this petrified us, and this kind of spurred us into doing what we're doing now at the moment, you know. But uh, we also take great heart in the Derry, Derry Straban. Uh, tourism document, Tourism 2025, a new level of ambition. Uh, I've got a copy of the first front, front page of it here. And it does say, uh, a strategic tourism partnership group made up of stakeholders from the private and public sector has been established to oversee the implementation of this strategy. And then it says later on, tourism is highlighted as a key factor of economic growth and jobs. There is much to do in the city and the rural hinterland, and I think we can tie into this document. We are very much appreciated that this document is in existence. We want to take you through some of the key items in the Straban story. Uh, the first part of our story that we can trace back to is a standing stone dated 2500 BC and that gives it about 4,000 years old, over 4,000 years old that this uh, stone is. The, the stone is in the old graveyard in Patrick Street. This graveyard was the location of a Christian foundation and church, and eventually the town that we now know as Straban was built in and around that area. So we can all say this is where Straban started. It, it, it is something that is important to us. And the other thing is that the graveyard, as, you, as the members will know themselves, is a council graveyard. So it's, it's, it's important to us, this. So I mention this to say that Straban is a very old town and has a lot of history, and we are proud of it. And we want to tell the story about this. And we also want our younger generation to be told about this because we believe that there's no understanding or belief that there is this history attached to Straban. So, uh, as I said, we were back in 2500 BC, which is a long time before me as well. So, uh, But uh, if we jump forward now to 1833, we've got a, a big event which we are very positive about. And Gordon is going to tell us a wee bit about Cecil Francis Alexander and uh, at that time as well. Is that okay? Well, thank you very much, Pat, for handing over to me here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that this is our last chance to save one of our historic buildings in the town of Straban. Uh, it was here, of course, that the renowned hymn writer Cecil Francis Alexander grew up here in Straban. She was 15 years old when she came to Straban, and she would spend the next 17 years uh, doing her work here in Straban, her writing and her charitable work as well. She, she, she deserves to be recognized here. Uh, over a period of time, she would write some 400 hymns and poems. Um, and one of these here was wrote in 1847. That she would do some of her greatest works that year. Uh, it was a year that uh, she published the next year, in 1848, she published her book, uh, Hymns for Little Children. And it was within that Hymns for Little Children that the three of her most famous hymns, uh, There is a Green Hill Far Away, 
and once in Royal David City, and uh, all things bright and beautiful. Uh, one of the most sung hymns anywhere in the Christian world at Christmas time is Once in Royal David City. Uh, I think the band needs really a little bit of pride, and the Heritage Centre would go a long way to achieving this aim. So I think the next time that you are in your own place of worship and you hear one of those hymns being sung, I think you should turn to your neighbour and just say, do you know that that hymn was wrote in Milltown House in Strabane? And I helped to save it. Thank you very much. Just to progress that story that, that Gordon was talking about, about famous people, uh, there are other literary giants within Straban. There's Brian O'Nolan. Uh, I'm sure you have all been to Straban. Of course you have. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll notice that there's a statue outside the Straban Library. Well, that's the statue of Brian O'Brien. Uh, Brian O'Nolan, sorry. That's what old age is about, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, Brian O'Nolan. Uh, he has a pen name of Flan O'Brien. Uh, he's, uh, he's got the statue outside the library and also the Straban Arts Festival, which is very nicely funded by the Derry City Straban District Council. It's also named after him. We've also got George Sigerson. He was another literary giant. He was uh, a great writer. He was a professor, surgeon, writer, and Gale. He donated the Sigerson Cup, which is complete, competed each year by the Northern Ireland and the Southern uh, Higher Education Institutions. And our local uh, GAA team is named after him. Sorry, the, the local club is named after him. It's the Sigerson GAA and is named after him. A point of note as well is that George's, uh, George Sigerson's daughter was Dora Sigerson Shorter. I'm not sure if she's anything to you, Jill, you know, with, but it's a short name anyhow, Shorter. But Dora Sigerson Shorter was a big uh, player in the, the uh, uh, women's emancipation, and uh, she was also a prolific writer herself. Uh, we don't stop at literally people. We, we've also got other famous sons and daughters. Uh, John Dunlop, who was the printer of the American Declaration of Independence, the Herdman family from Cyan Mills, where the three brothers came and set up a mill in Cyan, and it employed over a thousand people. We also had Annie Del Mondaire, who was an astronomer, and if you happen to have the time and are looking up at the moon, there is a crater there that is named after her and her husband. President Woodrow Wilson, his grandfather came from Straban. Guy Carton uh, was uh, an, a soldier in the American uh, fight for independence, the American Revolutionary War. He repelled the um, American advance on what is now known as Canada. If Guy Carton hadn't have repelled the American people or the American army coming, there would be no Canada today. It would be all U United States of America. So again, I, you know, I think this is why we have to be proud of what people from Straban done. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've also got Ezekiel Donnell. He was a great cotton merchant in the United States. We have Oliver Pollock, who invented the United States dollar sign. A guy from Breedy outside Straban. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but <laughs> but it is a good story. We also have Joe Sheridan. This is closer to my heart. He invented the Irish coffee. You know, because uh, a people and we've got a great, great photograph of him uh, giving a, a, an Irish coffee to a film star who you might know. I don't, I thought I had it here, but yes, here we have, you probably don't see it from that distance. Marilyn Monroe, 
We've got a brief photograph of, of Joe, but he came from Castle Derrick, just outside Straban. Again, this thing is all this project that we're doing is not about Straban town. It's about the Straban area. So we're covering the towns, you know, and uh, what we hope to do is to put these guys on audio visuals to have them uh, uh, people know about what they provided for the, the great world that we were living in and we'll have any memorabilia and artifacts uh, we also want to include those in, uh, in Milltown House itself uh, uh, other adventures that we're, we're kicking about with at the moment is genealogy about people learning their family trees. Uh, am I okay for time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, um, uh, uh, genealogy, but also what we want to do is about for education, to bring the schools together under the umbrella of Cecil Francis Alexander, who was a great Christian. She, 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 she didn't have any religion per se. No, she, she, sorry, she did have a religion, but there wasn't this uh, uh, divide in her community or her, her thinking about she was a Christian first and foremost. Uh, outside in the site, what we hope to do is to have rows of native trees and shrubs to tell the story of Straban in information uh, 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 panels. Uh, also stories about sports, music, and uh, transport, and also other hobbies. Uh, there was also a corn mill in the uh, uh, mill town site, and we hope to have some information on that because the, the backbone of Northern Ireland was built on mills, you know. And I know Cyan Mills has got their own big mill, but we have got smaller mills, so we can we can bo boast about that as well. And uh, also, what we want to do is to uh, consider a play park being included in the in the site and also to link it up with Burn Walk which is attached to the Drumralla estate which is quite close to where the, the, the uh, Milltown site is at the moment. My apologies Mr Chairman, I know I've overstretched it but thank you for bearing with me. Thanks very much Pat. Um, a very interesting and informative presentation. I wasn't aware that the Serban area had so many famous sons and daughters, uh, so there's, there's a lot of potential there for a visitor centre. Um, so you, you've had an opportunity to speak. I'm going to op open it up to the elected members. If you want to stand there, they might comment, but they might ask you a question. So right. uh, if you just be at your ready. So the first indicated speaker is Councillor Boyle. Michaela. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Pat and, and Gordon for their uh, presentation this afternoon. Um, a very ambitious one, and one that I personally would want to support. Uh, obviously, being from Straban, being the daughter of Straban, and I want to declare an interest as a direct descendant of Dr. George Sigerson also. And um, so I, I spoke with Pat uh, a few weeks ago just in relation to, to the proposal that he was bringing to Council. Um, obviously, it, it is. It, the, the site itself is very historical with the Gate Lodge and Milltown House, and I don't need to rehearse the, the history of it. Uh, and, and it's a fantastic document that you have put together. Um, and thank you to the History Society for doing that. And I'm delighted that they have come at this stage because there are, um, uh, and they're very aware that there has been a number of proposals in the past for the site. Um, obviously, uh, I know as recently as a few weeks ago, the education minister did say that he wanted to maintain it for educational purposes. And, and uh, you do allude to, to uh, the benefactor of education was Cecil Francis also uh, and her handwriting and stuff. So it would be great in that regard to see it kept. I mean, it is a very large, extensive site. Um, and. Uh, you know, asking, it's a big ask of council and, I, and it's a big undertake. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, uh, Straban History Society has, has done a lot of work in the past around other sites in Straban and pre pre preserving 
uh, sites and, and namesakes and, and different things. I'm just wondering, you know, what other, have you contacted the uh, Heritage Lottery or anybody else, or are we just your first first uh, approach to, to uh, getting support and help to, to preserve it? I think we were a wee bit nervous about going public on this until we felt we, we got the support of yourselves. And once we get that and get, and especially the support of the, the, the culture or the heritage uh, department, we, we didn't want to talk to anybody. We feel that we only want a strip of land down the side of Lisky Road. And maybe that mightn't be immediate. The, the big, big thing is save Milltown House, as Gordon rightly said, to save it. And because that's the iconic building. And once we get that, then we can work on the site. The, the site itself, I think from memory, Michaela, is 23 acres. So I, I don't know how much we'll be looking for. Thank you. And I do know, I do know in the town of Strabane, there is uh, cross community support for for the preserving of, of, of the Gate Lodge the, uh, and, and, and Mulltown House. Um, there is cross community support within my own area of Strabane for it also. So um, I, I would endeavour to do as much as I can to support the History Society and officers of this council to do what we can collectively in trying to achieve that. As I said, there are others um, who are looking at the site and it would be uh, our advantage to work with those other bodies or agencies at this uh, juncture uh, to ensure that you know we do as much as we can uh, in whatever way we can to support yous in preserving the site and I'm happy to work with yourselves in doing that. And I know my party colleague, um, Councillor Mickey Cooper, has a, a lot of knowledge in this as well too and I'd spoke to him earlier just about this presentation and, and about what, what else we can do as a council to support yous in the way forward with this. But um, I'm happy to support the proposal here today um, and uh, I suppose we'll hear from officers um, what, what, what support they can give also too. So thank you, uh, Pat and Gordon, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next indicated speaker is Councillor Raymond Barr. Thank you, Pat and Gordon, for coming along here today. We are very comprehensive and interesting presentation. In January of this year, I submitted a motion to Council asking that they investigate the possibility of acquiring the site with a view to development that they provide a visitor centre, a park and a nature trail. The motion was subject to an amendment by Councillor Rory McHugh to read that Council investigate the possibility of acquiring the site with a view to releasing it to address social need priorities, including potential for sport, play and recreational fa uh, facilities, in line with Council's park and play and pitch uh, strategies, and also to write the DFC advising them of the potential availability of the site which could be used for housing. Uh, that motion was unanimously, unanimously supported and passed. The EEA replied to say that they were currently considering the future of the site once it is fully vacated by the school. Should there be no further need for the school site and buildings, the EEA will formally dispose of the site in line with land and property service central advisory units publication entitled Disposal of Surplus Sector Property in Northern Ireland. The process, uh, this process includes a public sector trial to ascertain if there's any public sector body that has an interest in the site. I was happy to support the amendment as the site, as you said, had us 23 acres approximately and spacious enough to accommodate a number of projects that could prove beneficial to the and wider council district. Uh, as very eloquently illustrated in the presentation, Straban and the surrounding area has a very colourful and interesting history. Um, you sort of must out in some of the other things in the, from the entertainment world. Uh, from the world of entertainment, we produced Paul Brady, international renowned singer-songwriter. The Flipper Curtain, credited with being the first of the show bands, who changed the face of entertainment in Ireland. We also have the legend, legendary renowned half-hung McNaughton, who shot his fiancée, Marianne Knox, at Clock Car. For the Derry London Derry people, Clock Car is halfway between Derry and Strabane. 
Uh, he did this on November 1761, and he was hanged at the second attempt at Lufford Jail the following month. McNaughton was buried in Patrick Street Graveyard, Mr. Van, another potential for tourism. Uh, I attended, along with others, a workshop in the Everglades Hotel before Christmas, which focused on creating or promoting potential areas of tourist interest in the council district and outside of Derry's walls. Here now is a perfect opportunity to do just that, and at the same time raise the profile of Strabane and the surrounding area in general, and the Spurn Ward in particular. This is a golden opportunity for Council to create a sustainable cross-community, possibly even cross-border project, which will benefit all sections of the community, and at last give the area a landmark attraction which can be showcased all over the island to attract visitors to the district. The area around the site is an area of natural beauty and has been restored in years former glory by volunteers with the burn which runs through it, attracting numerous visitors during the lockdown. Cecil Francis uh, Alexander, as Gordon alluded to, is a world-renowned Tom writer who has penned the those well-documented classics. She lived in Maltown House. It would be unforgivable if this opportunity was missed by this council to create a genuine tourist attraction which could be the centre which would direct visitors to all those other areas of interest in the district. During informal discussions with Tourism MA, I received a favourable feedback in relation to this proposed project. This area has suffered neglect and negative publicity for decades. This is a chance to create something the whole community, rural and urban, can take pride in. I don't hesitate to say if this opportunity existed in any other council area, I would be grabbed with both hands. Uh, the old Maltown Grammar School itself has a proud and cultured past, being the first school uh, in the area to promote integrated education. Strabane Academy, which replaced Maltown Grammar when it opened its doors recently, is attended by pupils from every section of the community. Again, a very positive legacy for the school. I would like to formally propose that the officers of this community, committee, uh, formally engage with Tourism NA and the Education Authority in an effort to uh, investigate this project further. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, next up, Councillor Jason Barr. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. If um, Councillor Raymond Barr needs a seconder for that proposal, I'd be happy to second that also. But uh, thank you to Pat and Gordon uh, from the Straban Historical Society for their presentation here today and for playing their part uh, for keeping the history of Straban alive for the past 30 years. Uh, this site has become vacant very recently uh, when the Derry Road High School and Straban Grammar School amalgamated to now form uh, the new Straban Academy School. Unfortunately, within the first week of the school being made vacant, it was vandalised and it was very unfortunate to see, to see this. Firstly, I do strongly agree that this should be kept for the history of this uh, school and that not to be tumbled, especially for housing. I don't believe that this shape or the shape. I cannot be in. I'm good at sorry, a bit of a tongue twister there. That the site, <laughs> site <laughs> should be a. Uh, give me a second there, Chair, just to have your face is probably going to beat with red here at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> that the site should be kept and not tumbled. It should never be zoned for housing. I don't believe that the site should ever be uh, uh, zoned for housing. I welcome and support this proposal for a her heritage visitor centre to show any visitors to Straban the strong, rich history that Straban has to offer and the surrounding areas. But I also believe that this site uh, could and should be used as a multi-purpose purpose venue. For example, it would be a great location for a youth facility within Straban, which, is also, which Straban is in great need of. And not only that, it has the land to create a great outdoor area for local families, for example, a park and an outdoor walking area. And of course, a visitor centre, which is proposed here today, Chair, could I also propose that Council work with the Straban Historical Society in drawing up a strong business case to make sure that no matter who will own the site in the future, that this proposal is included within the plans for the site. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, we, we've had a proposal from Councillor Raymond Barr. Do you want to reiterate that? My understanding was that you proposal, propose that Council engage with Tourism ANI and okay, and Jason, you have seconded that. Mm -hmm. 
would anybody else like to speak on that proposal, namely that council on behalf of the Sravan History Society engage with Tourism NA and Education Authority? Sir, and, and thanks uh, to Pat for a presentation, which will come at this from my other work, and as Michaela said, in, in terms of developing heritage projects, and particularly funding for them. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential here, and in terms of my other work as a tour guide, and guiding in Straban, especially the, the peripheral areas in terms of genealogy, there's, there's obviously potential there as well. So I, I can see the merits, absolutely, in the project, and particularly to see Alexander's connections even to Derry in terms of St. Columns Cathedral, and she's buried in the city cemetery, and um, that wider sort of association with the Northwest in general, there's, there's, there's certainly mileage there in terms of the, the product, if you want to call it that, and the wider, the fact that you're focusing on Straban as well, in terms of the, the other personalities, and even the, the Sperrins and, and the Castle Derg area, David Crockett is another name, obviously, that we have to throw into the mix there in that regard. Um, there's a couple of things just, and, and it's linking under the, the proposal that was made, in terms of who you're actually approaching, um, because in terms of tourism, uh, tourism and I know from discussions with them even as recently as a few weeks ago, in terms of any capital and funding they have at the minute, um, there's there's not a, a massive pot of money there potentially that, that maybe would have been there in the past. Um, so it's it's more around widening out your options uh, is, is the key thing here because number one from the, the heritage perspective, Michaela mentioned heritage lottery in particular, and I think you've taken the right approach of getting the endorsement of council here first. But um, you know, I, I know from working with, with HLF on a number of projects um, that they are, in some cases, a lot more amenable than tourism and I to be blunt in terms of uh, this type of project in particular. And the fact that you're looking at the wider site and the fact that there's recreation and all of that incorporated under that, if as a society you're prepared to take on that work for the overall site, and I see you raising your eyebrows because I, I knew you were going to do that. Um, because that obviously opens up opportunities for engaging with the Department for Communities and, and all our departments and all our agencies as well. It's the key point about how much and how far you want to stretch yourselves as a society because I know from experience even developing a heritage centre and running it and getting the funding first and then running it um, is a major piece of work in its own right, never mind taking on 23 acres on top of that. And if, if you're looking at the idea of uh, forming a trust of some description, and bringing in all our expertise, that's maybe you know uh, the way to go in terms of the wider site. But it's the idea of, of maybe baby steps at the start, and that the building being preserved and being used for the her a heritage facility, I think, is, uh, is is the best starting point. And the fact that EA are still uh, exploring what they're doing with the wider location, you know, links under that sort of consideration. Um, so in terms of the proposal, um, I would just be wary of narrowing it down to tourism and I, because I, I think tourism and I will. will happily say, great project, will they resource it? I wouldn't be too sure, um, and happily say it, because I think they would say that themselves in, in terms of the current situation. So widening out your, your options a wee bit, maybe to speaking with all relevant funders, and I'm happy to speak to yourselves from my own background, as Michaela said, about what options you have and, and, and what sort of work is involved around the application. The other two points about it is on the wider proposal, is uh, you know there's sort of free apps when it comes to these. There's there's funding, there's footfall, and there's future proofing. Um, the funding we've discussed, uh, the footfall is about your audience, and again the, the genealogy in particular, the Ulster Scots elements there, will draw on a tourism market, a particularly in the North American market. In terms of your location, I don't know exactly where you are in Strabane, to be blunt, um, but if you have a good enough offer, that shouldn't be the biggest issue in the world. The fact that the the, the Sparrows future search pr process is still, as far as I know, ongoing to a degree, and obviously looking at the, the Sparrows Heritage Centre and how that wasn't successful in the past, how you make sure that doesn't happen again, uh, and, and make sure you are future-proofed in terms of getting the right level of footfall um, to wash your own face, as I would say. Um, a lot of heritage centres don't do that, they don't pay for themselves, and it's making sure then you have all our funding elements in, in, in place, and that means running events. Uh, making sure you, you can apply for all our pots of money. So all of that is in the round is is what you need to be considering. And it's not straightforward, but if there's a will, there's a way. And there's people here who would obviously support you in that practically. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, getting support of council is a, is a good first step. But um, in terms of the proposal there, I would just be advising uh, that it's, it's widened out to speak to all relevant funders uh, as opposed to just tourism and I, because that would narrow your options potentially.
continue. Thanks, Maggie. Um, Councillor Cusack, do you want to come on? Just on quickly, this? Councillor Cooper's already outlined what I was what I was uh, going to say. Just regarding restricting yourself to tourism NA, tourism Ireland. Again, there's a, a vast body out there that could be incorporated too. So it's just being wary about the restrictive sort of language within the proposal. But thank you, Councillor Barr. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm quite happy to uh, change the proposal to include any other relevant uh, agencies that we think might be helpful. Would anybody else like to speak on this? No. Oh. One. All at one mark. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And also thank you very much for the presentation. Um, obviously, our sparing councillors aren't on this committee from the DEP, but 100% supportive and everything you do, they would basically give us a briefing on the obviously up and coming presentation. But we're certainly happy to support anything coming forward here to the chamber today. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Graham. Um, Councillor Barr, you had a separate but linked proposal uh, that council assist in developing a business case. Um, I'm going to make a proposal here. Um, my understanding was that the Savan History Society came here today to appraise us of, of their plans for the site. Um, I felt the first step was that council officers engage um, with the society. Um, they give them their expertise. They outline potential obstacles, next steps, etc. I personally believe that council officers need to engage with the Savannah History Society and then we look at funding opportunities, then we look at the business case. We need to sort of firm up plans first. I do think we're probably getting ahead, ahead of ourselves. Um, so would people be happy with that approach that as a first step council officers engage with the Straban History Society, um, and I'd welcome the views of, of the committee on that, and obviously the Straban History Society as well. Pat? We wanted to have a discussion with the council to point us in the right direction on this. Now, this project is to be managed by a project by a group that is outside of Straban History Society. Straban History Society is not leading this project. We have got the nucleus at the moment of a group of people cross community uh, and what we want to do is for that project group to be looking after the, the project of uh, Milltown uh, House and Lodge on the site. That's my understanding of it, Mr. Chairman. But maybe, I ne maybe we need to go back. Now, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not adverse to this. Maybe we need to go back and discuss it with the people that we do have. You know. Yeah, and I just come on, just based on what you said and what Pat has said, um, in terms of that proposal that we help with a business case, if there are, there was a group of people who have the expertise, they actually pursued that part of it. There's no point in us reinventing the wheel, but if we get clarity on that, and if council, council's funding units, council officers who have expertise that may be able to be lent to uh, the people who are involved in your, your project board, if that's the right word to use for them, that that discussion can be had in, in, in due course if council officers need to offer practical support in terms of business case. I don't think that's any particular issue in terms of unkind support to get the, the application ready. Um, I don't think that's an issue. So uh, probably suggesting is they, they park the proposal of the business case is, is pursued at this point by council officers if some of that work's already been done or is, is in the process of being done.
Council, Mr. Chair. Maybe just to, to summarize, I mean, council officers are happy to engage with like whoever it is, whether it's yourselves or, or, or a slightly wider group, to maybe formulate this effectively more formally into a paper that then members can consider in terms of exactly what the next steps are um, so that they know those steps. So I think that offer still stands, and, and that's uh, you know, some Pat and I discussed on, on the phone on Friday. So happy for us to now engage with yourselves. You know, the, the proposal is a good one, and there's, there's lots of, of opportunities in there. And it cuts across a number of different departments and council as well. So uh, if we now start to engage in that, and then maybe bring an update paper back to members in a couple of months' time or whatever, whatever's uh, appropriate, and uh, for decisions from there as to how we move forward. Does that make sense? Councillor Barr, Raymond, I'm aware that you made a proposal. Are you happy enough with Stephen's update or sort of I'm, I'm, proposal? I'm happy enough of a fresh commitment from Council that they will engage uh, with Mr. Barr Historical Society and whoever else is involved in the, in the mix here. The big fear here, uh, without beating around the bush, is that this gets kicked down the road and we wake up some morning and that, that building's demolished. That's happened in Stavon before. And you know, to me, that would be, uh, as I said, and, uh, and my statement on Barry Road. You know, so, if there's a commitment to engage with the historical society and, and to uh, be proactive and, and, and pushing this forward, I'm happy enough. Thanks, Raymond. And Councillor Barr, Jason, you had a proposal about an assessment of the business case. Are you happy enough with the revised proposal? Thanks. Well, gentlemen, uh, you said you were nervous coming here, but you didn't act like it. So are you happy enough with the discussion yes, here? Yes. I'm an auditor by profession. I can add figures. That's my, that's my profession. You know, doing this is, 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 not, is not easy, but the, the, case is the case is driving us. The need to do something with a uh, Motown house. I'm not even from Straban and I'm getting emotional about it. So, so, <laughs> but I think it's the prospect, it's the prospect of doing something that Straban will be proud of and that you will be proud of whenever you, you give us the green light on this. I'm buttering you up here now, so. Okay, uh, Pat um, and Gordon, thanks very much for your attendance. Um, council officers will be in touch soon to engage, and we hope to see progress in this project. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the next item on the agenda is Chair's business. There's a couple of items that, that I want to mention. Uh, the first one was the, the sad passing of Sir Ken Robinson. Um, Sir Ken was an expert in the field of creative and cultural education, uh, and he was a great friend of this city. Um, in particular, he was a massive supporter of our successful bid for the City of Culture in 2013. Um, so I would like to extend our council's uh, condolences to his friends and family. Would anybody like to comment on that? No. Um, the second item that I would like to discuss um, is Invest NI and the, the Department for the Economy. We had invited the Minister for the Economy here to this committee. Um, I think I may have mentioned it a few times. Um, we wanted Diane Dodds here to speak about the economic performance of this council area uh, and to stress the argument uh, that NVSDNI and the Department uh, for the Economy must adopt uh, a regionally balanced approach to job creation and investment. This council's view is that the areas with the greatest need, the highest unemployment, the highest economic inactivity should get more attention and funding. The Minister hasn't accepted our 
proposal to attend, but she had indicated that officials from Invest NI and the Department for the Economy would be here in attendance at this committee today. Um, as you can see, they're not here. Um, it's vitally important that this conversation takes place, and in my view, it should happen as a matter of urgency. Uh, the minister's, minister's attendance uh, would be preferable, uh, but as a bare minimum, we need officials from Invest NI and the Department for the Economy here for a very frank conversation. Um, so Stephen um, has been in dialogue recently with officials from Invest NI and the Department. Um, he's going to provide a brief outline as to why they're not in attendance here today, and then we need to reach uh, a collective decision on how we progress this. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, Invest NI uh, officials were ready to present today, but we had no contact from uh, officials from the Department of Economy. So therefore, rather than, than come sort of have another rerun of what happened in February and it, it was just Invest NI, I thought it was important to delay for a month to allow time to get a, a, a person from the Department of the Economy to do a round of presentations. One suggestion that uh, Invest and I have, have considered is that they do um, a more rounded presentation with involving not just ourselves and council and the work that we're doing together, but also bringing in the University of Ulster and the Northwest Regional College to talk about the regional skills agenda. Um, my reading of members and, and, and hence the, my request to the chair to, to just address yourselves is that that's not necessarily what members of this committee want to hear that members locally are, are very aware of the issue of the the initiatives that we do as council they're very aware of the partnership working with the university of ulster and with the northwest regional college and really what members are exercised about is what is invest in i doing to address the regional environment so I suggested to, to uh, the chair that I would outline that in terms of what Invest in I is thinking and, uh, and then hopefully go back to shape how they're going to present. Because really, if I believe if we have another rerun of, of what was presented in February, um, it will be, I sure show the wrong word, but it won't really show any progress in terms of what they mean for this region. Whereas what members I feel are looking for is what are what progress has been made given the current crisis and given the current um, uh, situation that we find ourselves in, and clearly there there will be some things that will move faster than others. But there have been job announcements, there have been um, successes by Invest NI. So really, it is I think imperative that the officials come and show progress as to how are they going to address. The regional balance and the things that uh, uh, this committee was particularly exercised about when they last presented in February. So that was what I suggested to them, and I said I would talk to yourselves today, um, take a, a, a steer, and then go back to them. So is what they shape in, in October uh, when they come is is important. Thanks, Stephen. So just to clarify, they are coming next month. The question to this committee is whether it's Invest NI and the Department for the Economy together or it's Invest NI and the Department for the Economy and also University and Northwest Regional College. Is that correct? Okay, so I would welcome uh, the committee's views on that. Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Stephen. Um, well, in terms of whether I wasn't I wasn't aware they were coming on this particular committee this month. I know I have put a previous request that they will come on uh, on the back of their last presentation where they got lambasted for repeating the same old, same old, that they will come on on a sort of a six monthly basis from memory in terms of a, a progress report on where they were at. And I and Martin Anderson have met with the Chief Executive and the Chair of Invest NI um, on several occasions, um, remotely obviously over the the summer period, and again, they're not to say they're private conversations, but it's work in progress. And some of the suggestions coming from the people we were speaking to in terms of the, the sub regional or whatever word they want to use for that, um, 
w was encouraging, but it is very much early stages. Um, so I'm not going to elaborate more than that. But I wouldn't want them to be coming under this committee um, unless they were coming in with with concrete proposals around that. Um, so from my perspective, coming in around the skills agenda is a separate. <laughs> I wouldn't mind them coming in around the skills agenda and showing that they are collaborating with uh, Ulster and with the, the regional college. You know, we expect them to be doing that, um, but that's a separate issue almost. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, I would rather they came on with the, the more firmed up meeting the bones uh, of what they have been telling us, as I said, over the summer around adopting the, the sub-regional approach and how they propose to do that specifically. Uh, and if that means they come on in October instead of September, or if they come on in November, I'm, I'm not particularly bothered in one sense because I want them to come on with firm proposals, not to be repeating what they came out with previously. In terms of the Department for the Economy, um, which is obviously their parent department, um, and what Stephen has alluded to, at the end of the day, invest, and I will follow the lead of the minister. Uh, and as far as the minister allows them to pursue any particular policy direction, so it makes absolute sense that somebody from the Department of the Economy in particular the minister obviously comes on here and uh and outlines what the department's direct view is of, of uh, how proposals should be shaped to address the issues in this city so again if if invest and i are coming on here around the skills agenda i have no issue with them doing that but it's not in the place of uh coming on here from a possibly more senior level or all our members of staff at a more senior level uh to address the wider issue of policy change when it comes to sub regional investment. So they can come in in October if they want on skills, but I expect them to come back in November, possibly different people coming under the room and the P the FA officials as well to specifically outline what they're doing around sub regional. So that's uh that's my party's approach. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Uh Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair and um I'm going to agree with a lot of what Councillor Cabrera is saying. Uh, we, we don't need to hear, uh, this is what we've done on our skill set with North Wales Regional College and the University of Ulster. We need a commitment of what has been sub-regional investment. And I don't feel like Invest and I should be here on their own either. I do think that we need guarantee from the Department of Economy that they're going to have either the Minister or someone high up within the office officers to be here to answer those questions. Um, and like I say, we want actual what you have done since I wasn't here for the last presentation, but we want to see what's been progressed. <laughs> um, but that's, that's just a great completely. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Councillor Cusack. Thank you, Chair. I'm not very keen on the safety and numbers approach where you get all of them lumped together. So not only does it dilute the information that you can extract from them, but it also dilutes the time given to you know so many issues that we're going to need to cover with each of those bodies individually, whether it be, you know, the Invest NI, the Department, uh, Northwest Regional College, and the University of Ulster. They're all massive issues on their own, and by lumping them together, they do you do not give them the individual attention and scrutiny that they deserve. So I would be, I think, the party collectively are against that, and from what I'm hearing, the, the chamber would be against that as well too, because while while education and skills are an integral part of job creation, InvestNI is a separate entity when it comes to actually putting jobs here for people to go to coming out of education. So while they're all part of the same, same uh, area, they are very, very separate institutions, and they need scrutinized on that basis. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Shauna. Uh, Councillor McCloskey? Yeah, very much along the same lines. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland and the University of Ulster have two very separate remits and duties towards the people of the city and district. And I think it's fair to say that neither of them have uh, even begun uh, to fulfil their duty towards this uh, area. Uh, and again, just as, as other members have said, I think it's important that we tease out the specific issues with each um, body uh, that there I agree there's there, there's obviously a huge overlap and there's 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 relevance between them but I, I do think that it needs to be two separate meetings with very different uh, emphases thank you thanks um, just to come on because what Councillor Cusack said about you know, not the other what I said there was in terms of the skills agenda I think all of those uh, agencies and invest and I have a remit in terms of uh, upskilling in terms of uh, aligning themselves with what councils doing and ours around uh, 
particular reskilling in particular <laughs> during, during the current crisis. So I have no issue with a particular presentation being made because there's an item on here obviously today around what we're proposing around uh, upskilling and reskilling, and a lot of that involves those other uh, agencies and and the, the college and, the, and also university. Um, what I'm saying is we need a separate meeting or separate presentation or separate delegation coming on and I'd prefer as I said to wait until November if that's the case uh, of people from Invest NI sp uh, specifically on the sub-regional and what they've done since the last presentation to address that and, I, and we, they have told us there are proposals being developed up and worked up in early stages but we want to see meeting the bones so uh, that's just to clarify on that. Thanks Mikey. Uh, Alderman Ramsey. Thank you, Chair. Um, totally agree with what's been said so far. And yes, they all have separate uh, agendas, and um, we all know what we need. Um, I mean, we have the update on labour market interventions uh, um, that Councillor Cooper mentioned there, referred to there today. And you know, I would just, I would love to see exactly where we are with skills in this study. And I thought I asked about this before, whenever they were here, uh, about can we get you know, um, a survey done to find out where we are, are what we trade, trades people, uh, IT, whatever, see where we're at. And it would, I know it'll not, never happen, but the people who can make this happen for us in this study, if they could come together and try and have a joint strategy, and we know it's not going to happen, but the, the separate meetings is a, start, is, is a, a way forward for us um, to tease this out um, because you know, we are po going to be post COVID 19 hopefully soon, uh, but the recovery is going to put more emphasis on all of this, all the failures of the past. This is going to actually increase the issues that we have now. Um, so, to fully support what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thanks, David. So, there seems to be unity from the Chamber in terms of this. Uh, so, the consensus that I've gathered is that we're looking for a meeting with Invest NI and DFE officials only, uh, with none of the further education or higher education providers in attendance. But that is not saying we will never want that meeting, but on this occasion, um, it's DFE and Invest NI. That's Just to clarify what, I, what I'd said, see in terms of their proposal to one in October, on the skills agenda stuff, on the back of the fact we have this coming in today, I think it's, there's urgency on that as well. So if they're ready to come in, specific I and I people, along with Ulster and Northwest Regional College on the skills agenda in October, I have no issue with that. In terms of the, the sub regional, I would prefer they come in one item agenda on sub regional in November. So I, that's that's my proposal if that's what needs to be done. That is two separate members, it's different members of staff of I and I. But in particular, the sub regional will be a, a, a one item presentation, whatever way they want to uh, address it, uh, and that will be done uh, as soon as possible. But with, with uh, proposals coming forward, not repeating the same old uh, stuff. Councillor Mellon. I just thank maybe um, because there might be so many issues where um, other parties that might be coming in that people feel so strongly around them that we maybe, whenever we are bringing people in, if it is I and I, um, University of Ulster and the other two together, um, is that there's a very clear agenda that's set so that it's not um, once they've came next month that they're not coming back again for six months. This is a separate issue, as Councillor Cooper said, so they're coming in under this agenda, which means then we do have the opportunity to be bringing them back on the wider scale stuff. So if it is that they're coming next month, people are clear on why they're here so that we have the right people and at the right time. Cheers, Aileen. Yeah, sorry, I was just, Chair, I was just scribbling down notes so I can go back to them. So I'm reasonably clear on what needs to happen and what my views are. So. We'll go back in terms of the two separate presentations. Do we want each one and what their, their remit is? One on skills, one on sub regional uh, targets, and, and the sub regional competition. So um, I'm reasonably clear on what I need to go back and feedback to. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I, I just want to raise, and this is going to take forever tonight. Uh, 
I want to raise one final item in Chair's business. Then Alderman Guy wants to raise an item, Councillor Durkin wants to raise an item, and Alderman Work also wants to raise an item. Um, what I want to raise is about the Harbour Square redevelopment and the fact that here's sculpture. Um, it's virtually a year to the day uh, that we were in this chamber and there was a proposal to remove the Stitch and Time artwork from the Rosemount factory. Uh, there was a very justified public outcry, especially from the factory girls, um, and as a result it remains in place. Um, last July we approved a funding bid to the Department for Communities to deliver the wider Harbour Square redevelopment and at, as its centrepiece will be a public artwork uh, commemorating the shirt factory or the shirt making heritage of this city. Um, in October, we were informed that the application was submitted to DFC and that it could take several months to assess. Then COVID happened um, and undoubtedly there have been delays due to COVID. Um, so Harbour Square needs redeveloped. The fact that girls deserve um, the public artwork. Um, so I would be keen to know where that proposal or where that submission to DFC currently sits. Um, do we have any sort of time scales attached to it? Chair, I'll give you uh, members a brief update, but then what we'll do is we'll bring it to the back for October, which will we'll give you all the full detail. But basically, um, as we said, we put a, an initial proposal in. Um, we worked very hard on the procurement strategy of this, but this is not straightforward. Um, when you're putting an art piece in the middle of a regeneration piece of work. Um, in one way, I make no apologies for the delay, but I want to make sure we do not make the same mistakes that we've made previously, where the procurement strategy wasn't right and the foundations of the project weren't right. So that has all been now agreed, despite COVID, and it did cause delays in trying to get people and so on. So the procurement strategy agreed, the economic appraisal has been agreed, um, so that is now with the EFC, or will be very shortly for um, minister approval. The one item that we do need to, to it's, a, it's a simple item in terms of its financial, is that the initial cost for the first phase, which was the design team, was £100,000. And we were asked to contribute as council 10% of that, so £10,000 from council, £90,000 from the EFC for the, the first phase, which is the design team. Um, through this process, the, those initial costs have risen to about £170,000. So based on the same percentage, our uh, proportion would, would rise from £10,000 to £17,000. So we would need to approve an additional £7,000, and that will be in the paper for, for October. And it's also going into the Capital Working Group. That aside, that is now the only thing stopping going to the Minister for sign-off, and then we will get a letter of offer, and then also you go out to procure the design team. So progress has been made, and say it hasn't been easy um, because of the nature of the procurement, and it's taken a lot of my time, but not so much more, more the ca our capital team and Frank Morris in particular going through and getting it right to, as to where the artist sits against the design team and ultimately the construction team. So that kind of nuance is is easy words to say, but it, there's several different ways it could have been done, and we had to agree with CPD for the department the best way to do that. That is all nailed and done, so that is real progress. And uh, and provides us obviously with template going forward for any other um, artwork as well, because it's not it's that straightforward. But the progress is there, as I say, I'll bring a full paper back for members' consideration. That point in terms of the, the seven thousand pounds will go to the capital working group and uh, and then the economic appraisal will be signed off. So that's that's where we are, but as I say, I'll I'll bring forward a formal paper so the members know. Seven thousand. Councillor Logue. Yes, just to thank you for raising that that issue, Chair. It was just uh, one of the, the things that I suppose I was uh, concerned about too as well. But it's good, Stephen, that there is <coughs> progress um, being made. And I do appreciate that it hasn't uh, it hasn't been an easy process and we do want to get it right this time um i'm just aware that um i was part of the 
the, the group that met with yourselves and yourself, Aiden, I think you were there too, uh, Chair, um, and the, the group, the Factor Gears group too as well. And from memory, um, I do recall that we agreed maybe a meeting around the end of January again with them. Now, we all know the circumstances and timelines and all the rest, but I do think as a matter of courtesy and to save, uh, you know, I suppose speculation or whatever, that we really need to bring that group again back in some form. Um, whether that be uh, just before the papers brought or just after it, but I do think we, we really need to bring that group together again to just inform them as we said we would do. So, thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Councillor Cusack. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to thank you for raising that. Obviously, it is a very, very important issue that. Um, this whole council has been behind from the very start. Thanks for raising it. Thanks to the officers for, for keeping on top of it and, and, and making sure that it is progressing. And again, agree with Patricia on the need for continuity and keep everybody informed and in the loop. Thank you. Well, certainly to you, Chair. I'm happy to look at how we would engage with the group again. Obviously, there are the, the current restrictions and. Uh, um, but we have their details, so we will do that in advance of the, the paper going in, so it can be saved in the press for say that you know, we can uh, um, we can make sure they're updated. So, Alderman Guy, there's an item you'd like to raise. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that, man. Um, I'd just like to say a few words in the passing of uh, Canon Kerry Waterstone, who. Um, founded the Ulster Project in 1975. Uh, most members be aware that uh, Kerry and his wife uh, founded the Ulster Project, a peacemaking organisation working with teenagers from Northern Ireland, dedicated to promoting peaceful coexistence of Roman Catholic and Protestant children by building to tolerance, trust and ongoing positive relationships between potential leaders from both traditions. Kerry and Edie, along with a small band of supporters, both locally and in various towns across cities in America, have taken over 3,000 teenagers and group leaders from her own city, Cyan Mills, Castle Derg, Oma, Hermana, Korean and Belfast, on month-long stays with fallen American families, to build lasting friendships which teens which may, may never have met without such a subject or project. I was one of those teens, my eldest daughter too, my sister was a group leader for a number of years. We all benefited from lasting friendships made. Unfortunately this year my younger daughter, as well as yourself Chair, will know that due to COVID it had to be cancelled, but hopefully it will return next year stronger than ever. It's with this in mind that I believe that this Council, and remembering the late uh, Reverend Canon Kerry Watterson, should send a letter of condolence to his wife Edie and family. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Darren. Would anybody else like to comment on this? Uh, so, Councillor Durkin, there's an item you'd like to raise. Yes, I'll keep it brief, Chair, and thanks for letting me in. It's just to note the the recent developments, days that I'm not actually completely on top of, that I've been noticing on news feeds in terms of the Brexit developments and um, the potential chaos and the continuous disregard and contempt that's been shown by the British government. And of course, this is a business and culture committee, and it's been well documented in previous discussions in this chamber about the effects of businesses, workers, families and communities, but just that we'll keep an eye on the days to come as the uh, uh, information unfolds in terms of the detail of the relevant bill and um, just to assure businesses in this region, which is more impacted than anywhere else by Brexit, that uh, we'll continue to make representations on their behalf. Thanks, Mary. Um, and so the final item in Chair's business is Alderman Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to keep it brief as well. Um, it's just one for Council officers. See for the next B 
BNC Committee, could we bring forward papers on the more or less the plans for next year's centenaries for Northern Ireland? If there was, could be a wee update brought forward to this committee just to see what the plans are ahead. Uh, just can I bring some one more thing? I think it's for members. I think it's very important for members here. It's just one on social media at the moment. There's a very, very disturbing video going out, and it's it's more or less circulating around the all so, social media platforms where young people are seeing a very disturbing video out there. I just want to make you aware if you check my page or any youth page at the minute, calling out the more or less for parents to monitor young people's social medias because I have had a number of parents today have came across this on the young people's social medias, and it's very, very disturbing, very upsetting for young people too. Thank you, Chair. Alderman Wark, do you have a seconder for your proposal? Thanks. So, um, minutes of the last meeting. Um, on this item, is it matters arising? Tell you what it is, it's in the, the, uh, under the heading of economic recovery, the uh, reference to the British government's, what is it, 1.757. Two, two seconds, Councillor yeah. McCann. We're going through uh, for accuracy first, and oh, then sorry, it will be sorry, matters sorry, arising. Come back. Okay, for accuracy. Can we have a proposer for accuracy? Councillor McCluskey, seconder. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, matters arising. Councillor McCann. Yeah, uh, thanks for letting me in. Yeah, just I've been looking at it on uh, a page uh, four of the 52 there. It's uh, your own reference at the last meeting to uh, the uh, announcement by the British government of a 1.57 billion rescue plan uh, to help with the economic impact of uh, coronavirus. And I read here that Northern Ireland will be uh, allocated £33 million from the support package towards arts venues. Now that's what has intrigued me and I would look for some uh, uh, clarity on. Uh, because I read here that the country will take a lead role on behalf of the arts and cultural organisations represented in the city and city of Derry, uh, uh, city and district council to ensure that the funding support be, uh, uh, be provided. There's a number of ambiguities there. The reference in particular, I, I don't think we've got too much money. I don't know. I'd like to know how much is coming to Derry and Sudan from the, uh, what is it, uh, from the 33 million is going to come to the north. Well, that's uh, one subject that uh, uh, we'll have to come back to. But also the uh, reference to 33 million towards arts venues and not towards the arts. Now, Excuse me if I'm being a wee bit paranoid uh, about this, uh, but I'd be really concerned. I think there'll be a lot of people grabbing for bits of this money, you know, sort of a, a, a once they come through. And uh, a, and one reason I'm speaking to you from interest to Claire about this is that the Cinderella of the, all the arts funding is the visual arts. It is here, it is in Belfast and uh, everywhere. You know, and the interest I have is that I'm associated with the Boyd Art Gallery. Um, and uh, when uh, we look at the arts and the arts money, so to speak, is distributed. I mean, they frequently are presented. And one of the points I'm making is this: that the worth, the worthiness, sort of, of, of and the value, sort of, of the arts and culture can't be measured uh, according to how many people come to the door, how many people are there. And I say that because I've heard it suggested other ways that you can't pay for yourself or you can't come up with. 50% or 60% uh, of your revenue for your own uh, uh, efforts. Why should the taxpayer, as it's sometimes said, uh, uh, chip in? So, you know, it, that really, we have to be careful about that. And arts venues could simply mean, you know, paying for buildings, sort of, and, uh, and disrepair, and all the rest of it. So I hope that there'll be close consultation that it with people involved in the arts sector here and there, and that we get all that money for the arts. Uh, uh, and some of us will know that, that occasionally you get big sums referred to going to the arts. When you look at it afterwards, very few of it has gone to artists, very few has gone to the actual production or exhibition of art. It's very easily lost money with that sort of a temporary role of that. 
Uh, thanks for those observations, Councillor McKean. Um, when I made that proposal, it was twofold. One was that we contacted the executive to argue that the entire 33 million of the Barna consequential goes to not only venues, but organizations and individuals. Um, the finance minister has kindly responded um, in a positive manner. He had said that he was waiting um, a, a funding, well, a, a proposal from the DFC minister. Um, we haven't received a response from the DFC minister, and I understand uh, that staff and the directorate have, have emailed the private office today. So, be very clear: it's not just about venues; it's about organisations, and it's about individuals as well. And I, I made that case when I raised that at our last meeting. But thank you. Uh, just on the same issue, um, because the, the chair of Boy Gallery actually contacted Martin Anderson uh, in the last week uh, on that specific subject. Or sorry, the, the, the manager, right, the chief executive, right. I hope you declare an interest before you raise this. Huh? That's all right, never heard you. Never heard you. Um, so um, the, whatever position she's in, chief executive, whatever it is, uh, chief operating officer, whatever it is, contacted ourselves uh, this week on that specific issue and we will be meeting with herself uh, and the minister is already well aware, I mean I stated this previous committee, the minister was minister for culture during city of culture when the whole approach was that it wasn't just venues, especially the, well, the bigger venues but in particular smaller venues and practitioners who would get funding allocated uh, that would be edge the centre. That's still her view when it comes to the arts allocation funding, uh, the allocation of arts funding that is they uh, because she knows it's the right thing to do and it works. Uh, so she knows very well about the idea of the, the, the entire pot of money getting to the people who need it. Uh, that's not, not an issue and that's being again relayed to herself by, by Martina and, and others. So we'll have that discussion with her and uh, again it won't be just on board, it'll be on the, on the wider ecosystem there. But I, I have no issue that that money will, will have to grow and, and I can uh, confidently state that because of the minister who's involved. Thanks Mikey. Any other matters arising? Is this the same item? Yeah. Obviously, the, the um, prelude to that recommendation is, you know, yourself putting the proposal forward. But I distinctly remember that you also mentioned about the council being able to administer or have some form of a neutral body to administer that fund and just to make sure it did go to individuals, bodies, organisations as opposed to just venues. Can that be checked? Because that, that was a concern. Who's actually going to administer the fund and well, decide who gets the, my original proposal was that whatever the delivery agent was, was it DFC or was it the Arts Council, that organizations, venues and individuals in our council area uh, get a fair shout and that, that the money is distributed in a fair and equitable manner. Um, the finance minister agrees with that approach. And we're, we're still awaiting a response from the DFC minister. So. That's been chased up today, I understand. Any other matters arising? No, okay. So uh, next item on the agenda is item number eight, which is cultural grant aid programs update. And over to Aiden. Yeah, so thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try and be brief and summarise on this paper. Um, but members, you will recall in June that we asked for your permission to adjust the, both the community festivals and the headline events fund to, in effect, give organisations the option of delivering um, their, their event effectively virtually uh, or an alternative proposal by, for which they would be awarded 75% of the fund. We left the option in place um, for a number of for any event that felt they would be able to um, deliver an event, we left that in place if they were if they wanted to confirm that with us. And we also gave them the option of a 25% sustainability payment. So in short, we've had the majority of responses back from the applicants. And in the headline events fund, um, as understandably given the nature of those events and the fact that they're very much focused on marketing value and on large numbers of attendees, um, we've had in the overall pot, we have had a saving of just over a hundred thousand pounds. 
um, which I know our chief finance officer is, is quite pleased about. But um, but the so what the proposal basically, if you go across then to Department for Communities, and the, all of the figures and details are set out in the report. But we have had confirmation this year from the Department for Communities that they would not they will not be contributing to community festival funding which um, was to be an estimated about, about just over 30, on just under 30 and a half thousand pounds. Um, so it, that leaves us with about 93,000, which is due to be claimed through the various options that were vented to the community festivals recipients and leaves a shortfall of 7,000. So what we're proposing basically is that we take from the, we, we allow from the savings that we put that money over into community festivals. So it allows us to award, um, it, to award effectively everybody in the community festivals fund without having to, without having to be reliant on the Department for Communities money. Um, so that's that's really the, the what you're being asked uh, to approve the award allocation. Um, we haven't put the details of the individuals uh, recipients just for, for obvious reasons. But if there are any members, I have the details. If there's any members afterwards that want to know about the response from a particular um, from a particular event, happy to uh, happy to, to talk about that. So I hope I don't know, I hope that's clear. And if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to to take them. Thanks, Aideen. Would anybody like to comment on the proposal from any, would anybody like to speak on it or is that it? Okay. So next item is item nine and that's the Christmas 2020 uh, program and again over to the head of culture. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, this is a summary of our proposal for Christmas 2020. So I suppose this is a similar um, position to the paper we brought for decision around Halloween earlier in the summer. Um, it's clearly a very challenging environment for events of any kind. Um, and needless to say, it's a challenging environment for our, uh, for our budgets as well. So we're asking you members who have outlined the proposed program and, um, and to seek approval for the overall budget for this year's Christmas. Um, we're proposing to begin on the 21st of November and run activity right through to the 16th of December. Uh, clearly, this paper relates to activity coordinated um, by this directorate, but we work very closely with our environment section, who, as you know, are responsible for the Christmas lighting schemes so that so that we take a joined up approach to those. Um, we are, I mean, the, the public health guidance is um, you know a, a challenge and environment to operate in but we are so have set out a program here that will allow us to I suppose to be as flexible and as agile as possible um, and to be safe and to adhere to what we anticipate will be the, gu the guidance that will be in place over the next few months um, and we are confident that we will be able to ro roll out a, a really good program that will involve virtual Christmas switch on events um, in both the city and Straban, inside out Christmas themed animation program, a mayor's community Christmas program and the mayor's virtual Christmas tea dance. Um, there will be also a Christmas marketing campaign that will focus on a shop and gift local and support local that ties in with the um, campaign that's running at the moment that has been largely funded by Department for Communities with your small spend makes a giant difference. Uh, so again, we will continue that campaign to run into the Christmas festive period. Uh, we're obviously working with our stakeholders, particularly Visit Dairy and CCA, to make the most of those um, town and city centre marketing campaigns. The proposed dates there that you'll see are virtual switch-ons on Saturday the 21st in Straban, Sunday the 22nd of November um, here in Derry, and the 21st of November will see the start of the Inside Out Christmas themed animation programme. Uh, Wall City Market will be on the 5th of December and then there will be Christmas animation on the weekends of the 5th and 6th and the 11th and 12th of December with the Mayor's Virtual Christmas Tea Dance on the 16th of December. Um, there's further details set out in the report. The, the one thing that we don't think we'd be able to do this year is the Christmas Craft Fair in the Guildhall. Um, the numbers at the at the best times were challenging um, for the for the craft fair. So 
we're not going to be running the Christmas craft fair. We are confident that, particularly for our local crafters, that there are sufficient outlets for them in and around, particularly in and around the city. Um, it, it just, the, the, I suppose, it, it's a lovely event to have. But the, peop the, the traders that will be um, that won't trade are, are more likely to be traders from outside the, the city. And we, we know that there. Are, I mean, you'll be aware of those the, the craft outlets that, that exist. Uh, so it's just it, it was just felt that that part of the of the regular. Um, if, you know, Christmas program was just too difficult to, to manage. Um, but we're confident within the, the budget that we have that, um, you know, that we will be able to deliver a safe and, uh, you know, an innovative Christmas campaign and Christmas events. Uh, I should say we always would have had uh, Christmas and particularly at the request of members over the last few years, Christmas in the communities. Now, you'll be aware of the wider financial pressures facing council and the Christmas budget. Um, the, would generally have been about £80,000. So we're working at the moment to revise budget of £20,000, um, and, and that's what the programme set out in the report is based on. This means that uh, the budget previously available to Christmas in the communities, at, that, at the level it would previously have been awarded, won't be available. So we're proposing just to bring that down in, in, I suppose, in accordance with the wider budget and to make a maximum of £3,000 grant available to all the neighbourhood renewal areas who would have pr traditionally participated in this activity. You'll also be aware that historically a grant of £1,000 have been given to communities in Castle Derg, Newton Stewart and Zion Mills for switch on events. Um, the £3,000 for these three areas has been allowed for in the overall activity. Um, and we're aware that there, every year there are requests for funding from other towns and villages, which it's impossible to accommodate within the existing budget. Um, you will also be aware that Christmas switch on events are eligible for community festival funding. And, you know, communities any year who wish to apply for that can, can do so. Um, the total available budget, as say, is 20,000 for um, Christmas events, a marketing budget of 8,000. If restrictions are lifted that will allow us to do additional program within a suitable time frame, we will uh, have that further discussion with Council's Chief Finance Officer to see if additional budget has been made available, can be made available. Um, so members, you're asked really to approve the, um, the arrangements set out in the report and the current budget allocated to the events. Happy to take any questions. Uh, Thanks, Aideen. Uh, first indicator, indicated speaker was Councillor Cusack. Shauna. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Aideen. And thanks for all the work that has gone into this. Again, um, not easy um, trying to promote somewhere where you can't actually you know, have the, the major events that we've all been used to and really, really enjoyed, especially for families. Just want a wee bit of clarity on one thing. We've got the virtual Christmas light switch on on the 22nd of November, and then we have the inside out themed animation also on the 22nd of November which wouldn't su uh, suggest that you're bringing people into the town but then it's also a virtual event. So how, how is that going to be managed, the, the animation? Is, is that actually going to be animated, the walls or what way is that going to work and if, if there are people being like families for the walkabout, how is that going to be managed and, and how is security going to be put in place to make sure that you know that all the social distancing rules apply? Well, it'll be managed very carefully. That the animation is really is is not of significant scale. I mean, you we would you would have seen sort of elements of what we're proposing. Um, I think it was the weekend before last uh, when um, the uh, Carnival of Colours event happened. So it, it's very low key. It happens. It's qu quite spread out. Um, so it will be it'll be managed very effectively like that. And the, and the switch on itself will there will be no um, there'll be no activity. As such, it will all be done. It'll be done virtually, you know, um, to create a big impact. But there will be no, um, there will be no encouraging anybody to come out. Um, it's really just that's one of the key weekends, and I suppose you want to encourage people to to continue to shop. But we won't be giving any sense that there will be any event as such that day. But you know, to I suppose it's a really it's a really difficult balance, and we're facing the same issue with Halloween. But it's um, so I suppose our main objective is to try and have some level of animation that encourages the level of people that we want to see coming safely into shops and restaurants um, and the city and town centres without encouraging any more people to come for the events themselves. So it's that balance of appearing that we're open for business and encouraging those people who, you know, at the level that we want them to come out, to come out. Um, and I suppose that's part of the messaging around this, the Christmas program and indeed the Halloween program is that 
we are doing as I suppose we want to maintain some presence, some life uh, up to some degree without encouraging too many extra people. So it's really just making the experience good for I suppose, those people that we want to see coming on any given day to come and shop um, and and participate safely. So we are, you know, we have all of our, our safety team will be very monitoring things very closely. And if there was a situation where on a given day that we think there are, you know, if word has spread that there's all sorts of activity happening and we start to see that there are people coming, we won't proceed with that activity. So we'll be very closely monitoring that. We're working protected with the communications team and that to monitor things like social media and stuff to make sure that we manage that as well as we can. It's really, really challenging and it's really difficult, but I hope that it's sort of clear what we're trying to achieve. Um, and particularly for Halloween, it's about, I mean, it'll, maybe it comes up later, but Halloween really is about trying to maintain the name of Halloween and so that nobody gets the idea that Halloween or Christmas are cancelled but it's trying to do those things in a safe way that uh, you know allows people to have a good experience but not have too many people together in the one place at the one time. Thanks Aideen. Uh, Councillor Ferguson, Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for the report. Uh, I know um, you were kind of coughing whenever you were in mid-June there having to talk about Christmas coming up. <laughs> Um, it's brilliant, and again, you have put a lot of effort into it, and it's a, a much smaller budget than what you expected to, and, and a completely different circumstances than what we expected. I know we had the discussion around Halloween with the working group about the importance of the businesses and how they're going to lose out with those numbers coming into the town centre, and you have come up with a great trail, a retail trail. I know that not spoilers, but that's coming up later. Um, I don't know whether, like the Christmas craft fair, maybe something could be done similar. You know, um, highlighting people where those crafters within the city might be and, and given that kind of the, the buzz of shopping local again but no, um, I'm happy to propose it if it wasn't proposed there by Councillor Cusack um, but thank you for the report Thanks Rachel, so uh, Councillor Boyle, Michaela Thank you Chair and thank you Aideen for your report um, it certainly is going to be a Christmas with a difference this year and um, I just want to pay tribute to the work that your, yourself and your team have been doing in terms of looking at uh, innovative ways and creative ideas on what to do. Um, there's a lot, everything's been virtual um, up until now, and I suppose there is maybe a slight expectation on the public that we would be doing something different and new and innovative and creative. Um, but it is, in, in light of the current situation, it is very, very difficult to to do anything other than virtual um, and I suppose just in terms of the Christmas light switch ons Aileen, um, I know the the main ones Straban and, and here in the city um, obviously that will be virtual but the smaller ones within the towns and villages I mean obviously you wouldn't want to be um, uh, advocating people to, to come out in crowds but you know, I'm, I'm just wondering how that's going to be managed, and, 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 and you know, at the time, uh, because people have been deflated over this course of the last while, and communities will want to do something like Christmas a wee bit special, um, and it'd be very difficult for them to do. I'm, I'm talking about the towns and the villages. It'd be very difficult for them to do uh, that and manage the expectation of, of, of the local community as well too. So. Um, I'd just be keen to hear just a wee bit more just around the, the villages switch on and that type of thing, um, if, if, if that's going to be the practice as well as virtual or, or what way is that going to pan out? Uh, in short, I don't know because we don't deliver those the switch on events outside of the city here and and, and in Straban. Um, we, you know, communities can get funded and and some communities are funded for those events. So I suppose we would be advised. I mean, and the safety advisory group will advise all of those groups around the public health guidance. Um, and and that's I, I suppose that's why we have uh, we're working with them all. I mean, that was the sort of um, a tenure of the grant aid report as well. We've worked with all of the um, all of our recipients of grant aid to allow them to adjust their programs um, and and to support them and advise them as best we can. But I suppose ultimately it's up to those communities and it's up to the organisers of those each of those individual events to adapt their um, 
their activity and to you know to to ensure that they're safe. We you know we we anybody that that needs guidance on that we're happy to give it and the safety advisory group will do the same. But it's their their particular event, so they need to to take I suppose they need to take that responsibility for the safe delivery of them. And I suppose it's just it's vitally important that they are financially supported in doing that as well too, in terms of what they want to be doing in terms of their creativity around the different uh, events that they'll be planning. Um, I just want to also um, just in terms of the crafters as well, and I know we had a very successful. Cra Christmas craft fair here in the Guildhall last year, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Well attended over the number of days, and and there was a lot of crafters who were, you know, couldn't get into the Guildhall, you know, to display um, their work. Um, is there any thinking outside of the box this year in terms of? Um, I know, like in Straban, we do have a number of empty premises um, that crafters would have the opportunity to maybe avail of those empty premises like they, some of them have done in the past to, you know, in the run up to Christmas to um, show and, and sell their their um, works of art, whatever it, it, it is. So is that something that can be explored maybe, you know, going forward with with, with the empty premises, um, particularly in my own, I'm talking parochially about my own town. Yeah, I suppose that if the, if there could be more happy to support crafters if there are ones that, that want to do that. Um, we ha you know, we have previously have we do sell some crafts in the Alley Theatre, and there you know there are other outlets that will take crafts for, um, for crafters. And again, to go back to Councillor Ferguson's uh, point, the 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 places that already sell crafts, we will they will be very much part of the shop local campaign. Um, it you know the the craft fair itself. There are large numbers of traders from outside, from other parts of the, you know, from outside the council area, I suppose. So we just felt that we were, you know, what, that, and the, the feedback from the crafters is while they would love to have the craft fair, they would find other outlets, you know, when they were, they knew, they were aware of the challenges. So, um, so yeah, but certainly if there are, if there are ones that approach us and, and are looking to, you know, for advice and guidance and support on, you know, setting up as a craft collective, we would be doing that work anyway with, with anybody who's interested in that. Thank you, Aileen. And, and just lastly, uh, Chair, um, any marketing program that would be done um, around the city and, and the district in terms of Christmas and Halloween? Um, obviously, and I know uh, in some people um, locally in, in the town of Straban would say that Straban it seems to be more focused in and around the city. So if there was a marketing campaign, you know, to ensure that Straban, and I mean maybe like a TV advert or something like that, if that was for Halloween, that, that Straban would be included. And I'm jumping ahead here, Straban's next, to, or look, Halloween's next on the agenda. But if there was any TV marketing advert or campaign to be done, just to, you know, be, and I'm sure you will be mindful that, that Straban's included in, in any of those advertising campaigns. Thank you. Mr. Mellon, anything? Chair, um, I was just to um, maybe look for a wee bit of clarity around the agenda that's set out for Christmas time um, in regards to the budget. Um, how much of the budget will be allocated towards the Mayor's Community Christmas programming? I'm just thinking around in terms of the Christmas in the community. Would, if we were saying that like Halloween, like Christmas, we would be focusing on DEA or NRA, whatever kind of focus it was within local areas, that we could still, we're not being able to promote a lot of the businesses and economy and stuff within the town centre, but we still have our cultural remit within this committee that within their own communities that we could be spreading some Christmas cheer and there be activities for everybody and it's it's really coherent around different community structures, so instead of having um, it through the mayor's um, initiatives that it would be based within the communities and the involvement of course with the mayor being invited to, to all the, the council areas. It just means that it might work more coherently with, with what's already going on within Christmas in the communities and they can work together what's best for each DEA. Um, it was just 
to note, and I know um, these things have to be professional because we can't predict what way it's going to be um, come December time. But today we're able to sit in September and talk about Halloween in October. So I would be very much hoping that before this was going live, that if there was adaptions that we could bring th things out of virtual and in the physical land, that we were able to do so, so that we would have a platform for that. Um, and I know it's being really optimistic, but we're better thinking that way and leaving ourselves that we do have a forum to transfer that stuff over. Um, because I don't know about anyone else, but we've all talked about how great it was working from home at the start, and everybody loved it. Um, but we can slowly but surely see that people are looking to come back to work. They're looking to come back out into the community. Um, and then we can see the, the benefit of that as well. Um, and they look around the neighborhood Vernal areas with other Christmas in the community. Um, the, is that going to be based on neighborhood Vernal areas or is it DEAs or is everywhere going to be included? So I suppose that was just the two points. So is this based on DEAs or is it neighborhood Vernal's? And then just looking around the mayor's um, Christmas in the communities, can that be allocated over the community? So there's sort of, I suppose there's two strands to that, that activity, but they, they will be very much coordinated. One is obviously the mayor's funded um, Christmas program, and so that will involve the mayor in communities. Now that will be across all communities and right across the city and district. So I know we're working with the mayor's office to have a strong program there that will allow the mayor actually, to, I think, to visit and have actual activity as much as possible in the communities. The Christmas in the Communities Fund and then is to neighbourhood renewal areas, but we traditionally and have always coordinated those two. I suppose the mayor traditionally would have done his or her activities in the Guild Hall or um, in the alley in Straban, so they would have been very much based in there. I mean, you'll recall we would have had Mrs. Claus and various other, um, the mayor would have had activity running over various weekends. That's not going to be possible. That, you know, it's not going to be possible to bring those sort of numbers to people, which is why we have developed this, um, you know, mayor's community Christmas program. So there's those two sides of it. Um, in terms of going from virtual to real, where possible, we are trying to do smaller scale real stuff. Uh, so that's why the mayor's program is small scale stuff in communities. Again, coordinated with um, the with any. I mean, that budget that will be allocated to the neighbourhood renewal areas, generally those areas will come up with activity that they want to do that is coordinated and bolted on to all of the other activities. So there's one crisp, big Christmas programme. Um, in terms of the, the you know, in, in terms of if things are opened up, we are absolutely planning for that. And that's why if restrictions are lifted and as the, you know, as the weeks go on over the next month or two, um, if, if it is looking like we can do a bit more and we will have that cut discussion with the Chief Finance Officer and we will adjust accordingly and try and increase activity accordingly. Um, but where possible, we are planning to do actual activity, but smaller actual activity. The one thing that's that is complex is obviously the switch on because traditionally that's one of our biggest gatherings of single gatherings in the year of people so that's why we are very much keeping that a virtual event at the moment now you know it would be great if by the 21st of november we were back to um being able to have an event of that scale that's probably not likely and it's difficult to break that down into smaller events or you know um so the lights will need to go on at, at one some point um, and we won't be encouraging people to come out into one place to do that switch on. But so that's what we're we're trying to balance. Um, but very much trying to have as much real activity. Um, and I say that's why it's a community. So there'll be multiple smaller things that are are safe. Thank you, Aiden. Um I suppose that was probably my point around um, the Christmas and the communities. You can see over lockdown, over the COVID period. We have seen a lot of community spirit and it's around tying in with that as well and not to lumber too much on. I just want to make sure there's no duplication of activities and things going on. We have, you know, 20% of our budget. Uh, we need to make sure that 
we help get more farm money. Uh, we need to make sure um, there's activities not being planned on one part of the budget and it's already the same in the other. And I think the people who drive that is the people here within these communities and within the NRA. And that was the reason for me asking around um, the mayor's virtual or the mayor's community Christmas programming in terms of the Christmas in the communities. They even sound the same. You know, they get, you get mixed up in it because it sounds that it's the same program that the communities are leading on. They're able to look and see what the need, what people are interested in, and who can sign up in terms of the smaller community organisations. And then you have the same thing happening again throughout the city and district. So I think that if it was focused on the her area and we made that decision, there could be more for your money within them. And I do understand some areas that may not have them structures and may need support and help with the council, as Councillor Boyle had already said, around where people need support to where they aren't them structures, that it will be provided. I suppose what I'm asking is if I could propose um, that that allocation of the budget be put into the Christmas in the communities. Aileen, what's, I think it's three grand for neighbourhood renewal areas. That's what it says in there, isn't it? So what's your proposal? My proposal, first I have asked what amount within the 20 grand budget is going to the Mayor's Community Christmas Programming and asking can it go under the... That's the Mayor that's the has a budget, separate so budget. coming out of that? Nope. Right. So it looked as if it was, but even if it can be tied under the neighborhood renewal area so that there isn't duplication and we can try and spread I, it. Absolutely. So, um, so apologies if I wasn't clear. No, that is a mayor, it's a mayor's funded, which is why it appears separately. It's, it's very much a sort of a, a separate activity, but we work very, we work very closely. You know, all of these elements are coordinated. They're just, I suppose, they're, they're slightly different, um, slightly different things, but we, we've always done that to make sure that there is a, cohesive Christmas program um, so th so that the you know we and we work very closely with the neighborhood renewal areas who get that money to agree and discuss what the program will be so that it fits with everything else that's happening so that that has always happened and will continue to happen and it just may, and I appreciate that, uh, that there might be a wee bit confusing because they both say community but as I say this is the first year that we're very, that the mayor is doing really community-led activity that's in the communities as opposed to generally the mayor leads stuff in either the guild hall or um or the alley over the years and you know communities come in there i suppose and, and everybody comes in to to participate in that um that activity that's funded by the mayor and delivered often directly by the mayor but so so i can assure you this is very much coordinated and is a separate mayor's budget So, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Aileen. But just to follow on from what Aileen has been saying, I think we can all agree that we have seen through social media or for our own selves how well uh, the infrastructure within the neighbourhood renewal areas uh, have delivered for their communities over the past uh, COVID. Um, especially, um, you know, animation and, and trying to lift people's spirits and, and do all that. And that expertise is there as well as the volunteers who, who help out. So uh, I'm just, forgive me, but is £3,000 a reduction? Do they normally get five? What? Yeah, they normally get, uh, it's three, it's normally got 18, it's three fives, it's 18. So yeah, it is a reduction. There's uh, normally eighteen thousand you know, allocated. And, yeah, and I, and, I, and I am aware. Look, the the budget is normally eighty thousand, and it's, it is now um, quartered to twenty thousand. Yeah. Um, but I'm just also aware of how good the neighbourhood renewal structures worked uh, within communities, and a reduction of that, especially when communities need to be lifted and there's not going to be any big, um, I suppose, citywide or council-wide events, that it will be left to communities to try and lift where the capacity is there 
surely agree with the mayor doing whatever where there's no capacity in the council and that. But within community uh, uh, neighbourhood renewal areas, I think you know that they said it at three thousand would be a bit of a mistake maybe on our part where you know they can deliver far more for you know especially given the times that's in it. So I'm just a bit reluctant to agree on the three thousand. That's what I'm saying. I think the point that we're trying to make is because uh, I know it's a separate mayor's budget um, and we know that usually the mayor would not have gone on the community areas um, because he would have done an event centrally. I think the point is in terms of avoiding duplication in one element and also in terms of maximising what can be done in areas that are already arranged events anyway. So if we're allocating three thousand pounds per NRA instead of the, the usual fund that, that we, we have, it's, it's, it's reducing what they can deliver through budgets coming from this from, from, our, from ourselves. Um, if there's areas that don't have no events organised at all, if the mayor's going to those areas, absolutely, I see that there's a need for that. They show that this council is, is bringing the mayor into those areas. But I think the point is, in terms of the budget the mayor's allocating for the wider, for his own wider programme, if there's a bit of smart thinking in terms of discussing with the NRAs, if there was possibly a way of some of his budget being dovetailed with the NRA budgets, because then it, it avoids duplication and the mayor can still go into those areas and, and do his, his event with Sam and his protocols, all the rest of it. But it actually increases capacity within the NRAs to deliver. Because there is an expectation now because they've been doing so well in terms of the type of events they've been doing the last few years that they, we don't want that to be reduced. Because after Halloween this year, because there's going to be more of a community focused approach anyway, we don't want people then to see Christmas not fall flat in his face. But have a much reduced capacity. So the point is, I think, to be smart on this, that the mayor's office discusses with council officers around and the NRAs about maybe dovetailing some of the, the, the money that would have been allocated to bring the, the mayor into those areas. And that's you're going to get bigger bang for your buck, to be, to be, to be blunt. And then areas that, don't, areas that aren't NRA, areas that aren't organising anything themselves, the mayor absolutely goes on, spends his own budget. But where there's events going to be happening anyway, Try and dovetail it a wee bit, and it might be a better outcome for all. I think that's a, the, the point we make. So happy to do that. Happy to speak to the mayor about that and the mayor's team about that uh, about that proposal. I suppose it's just it's three thousand pounds grant from the total uh, for the all for all the neighbourhood renewal areas. And I suppose if we want to increase that, we have a number of options. We uh, we can talk to the mayor about diverting some budget to the the Christmas and Communities. It, wa it was, f th so those five would have got three multiplied by five, so it would have been 15,000. So it's reduced to three this year, which has brought. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Sorry, it's, it's come down accordingly from as, as, as in the 80 to 20. Now, we can do a number of things if we want to increase that pot. We can, as I say, we can talk to the mayor. We can take activity from the wider, we can take budget from the wider 80,000, or we can go back and talk to the chief finance officer about increasing that pot. So we're happy to look at that if that's what you want us to do. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I just want to be clear, but, um, so, but I'm, we're absolutely happy to do that if that's, uh, if that's what you want. No problem. Alderman Ramsey. This has been well thrashed out, though. <laughs> right, so it is. Um, just first of all, just to thank you and the team for, let's face this, very, very difficult one for you. And, you know, the thing is, how do you, how do you market some something and not want crowds? You know, it's a difficult, difficult one to do. Um, we've, we've mastered the, the restaurants. We've mastered all of uh, shopping and all that there. So we're not worried about, obviously, people coming to do their shopping locally and all that there. But I think, um, as a council, we do need to be really pushing out there about this probably as a Christmas for family bubbles. Um, you know, and that doesn't stop you doing what you're doing today, you know, on a daily basis now as it is. But uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing around Christmas is, the good thing is it's not going to be cancelled and this council is not going to cancel Christmas. Um, but it's just so difficult. The, the most important thing is uh, 
the biggest issue for us, obviously, is crowds. We, we just can't afford to have crowds of people um, gathering for any any event. Um, and I know that we, we as a council have been very, very good and our, our community uh, throughout our communities have been very, very good uh, in uh, basically keeping safe. Um, so obviously welcome the report and um, support uh, the, the, the arrangements that have been made. Um, and as I said, we have mastered most of the things. I know the, that the pubs are opening soon and I know that seems to have been a big issue um, but again everyone knows the situation with social distancing um, and uh, you know there was, it was on uh, Radio Foil one day uh, there was a, an elderly man came on and he said social distancing is common sense because anybody that is within a meter of you is not actually invading your space and he said the only time that he ever would have been less than a meter uh, talking to somebody is if he's curtain or a gear frame and that, that was a very, very true and, and right statement. Anything inside a meter is actually invading your space. So people have learned, and the bars, uh, I know they will step up as well uh, whenever they open, the same as our restaurants, the same as um, uh, all of our shops have been fantastic, obviously. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Alderman Work. I'll keep this one short here, but um, more or less, as Alderman Ramsey said, or Christmas in cancelled, and obviously what I'm thinking about here is the young people of this city and district, and looking what we're not going to have, and I totally 100% agree with that, because we're seeing second wheels spread and throughout UK, down south in certain areas, and something our council stepped up the market St. Patrick's Day, more or less 11 super councils in Northern Ireland, and our on the, the COVID-19, but what I'm thinking here, there really had to be a bit dumb, a bit of Christmas spirit, Christmas light about this city, you know what I mean, with the lighting, with animation, something, like we have a square over there, Everton Square, is there anything going to be on that whole square, or is that just going to be there, we won't sell a Christmas tree, where you're on about stalls, why can't we place them there, because we have the area over there for um, social distance, so we do. And what I'm thinking really is the impact of the young people, they've absolutely been through hell this 2020, and I know everybody on here can't wait for the, the 31st of December <laughs> they get through this year, but what I'm thinking is these young people at Christmas, there had to be something from this council, they more or less a bit of light and make sure this is one of the best Christmas them young people ever had. And space, as David said, it had to be with families, obviously, but this this puts something out of the ordinary, get our heads together and make some bit of light for this Christmas, put a bit of Christmas spirit on it. Thanks, Graham. Uh, there, there's mention of Everton being... Uh, Graham, it, it's on there, item 3.4. More. Okay, well, my view on this is, you know, Aiden has clearly demonstrated, you know, that the budget is. 20 grand plus eight for marketing. Yeah, I think if we, we're if we're if I mean, we've been clear there, if we can do more, we will do more. And we, you know, the chief finance officers indicated that we can have a, you know an ongoing discussion about the budget um, for this. So if things open up and if we are able to do more, um, we will have that conversation, and we will certainly have that conversation around the specific issue with um, relation to the community funding. So you know that that so we we, we will do what we can. Absolutely. Very conscious of, you know, the, the fact that we don't want to be killing Christmas. <laughs> for my own benefit and for the benefit of the minutes, Sh Shauna, you proposed this. And who seconded the, the item? Yeah, so the actual item was proposed by Councillor Cusack and seconded by... Councillor Ferguson. 
but there's an agreement that 18, uh, I'm not going to tell the mayor how to spend his budget, you know, that's, that's his decision. Um, but you're going to liaise with Alfie to see if there's any scope Absolutely. in the budget. Absolutely, and we can bring back a further report on that uh, in October. We can bring back a report each month between now and, and uh, December. And, I mean, there's no problem with that, and I, I can give a direct update on the on the community stuff. Absolutely, if members want that, we can. Well, I was going to say, are people just happy with it? Yeah. Yeah, right. And just to enter on the minutes that we are very concerned about the £3,000 for the neighbourhood renewal areas that we feel that they're, they have a lot to offer and we should be tapping into their expertise. And they're happy if the proposal is that we investigate uh, additional sources of funding or, or, or how to creatively fund that, yeah. We're done on that item, thankfully. Um, so next item um, is item 10, and it's labour market interventions. Over to Kevin. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I was just uh, interested in some of the commentary actually earlier around when we were chatting about Invest DNI and skills in particular. I mean, there is 2019 UEPC did a skills barometer for Derry City and Strabane. I actually did it for Derry City and Strabane and Causeway Coast and Glens, the two councils. So as of 2019, we do actually have accurate data in terms of the sectors um, at that point where they thought the sectoral growth was and where the gaps potentially were, you know, in terms of skills basis. You know, um, they had made some commentary in that report around the sectors which were in decline. And at that point, retail was still remained in decline, but clearly the pandemic um, supercharged that decline. And, you know, we all know this, it's well rehearsed now in terms of what we're seeing on the high street and our towns and city centres. And so we, we did have data at that point. Clearly we might need to, you know, at NISRA level, at, at, at executive level, and, you know, at, and through our strategic growth partnership, consider whether that data is still accurate and what the impact of that is. So when we're making our plans and we're starting to think about what interventions we need to do in relation to COVID particularly, we are taking into account the data that's available. So I just, I just wanted to make that point, and I suppose the purpose of this report is, is the is the inform members that um, clearly over the over the years we we have a ring fenced kind of skills budget, and we're doing um, we've always been doing um, specific inter interventions, whether that's around apprenticeships, whether that's around skills academies, whether that's around um, promoting um, skills um, uh, and pathways as a way to uh, get a job and to create create employment. Um, this report is more around what we're doing. What we, what we have the ability to do with others and collaboration um, in the skills environment as a direct result of COVID. And in July, we, we, um, the paper we presented, we focused on careers guidance, which was identified as being crucial, health and well-being, apprenticeships, skills academies, and employer incentives and support and inclusion in education. Um, it won't come as a surprise to members here, I'm sure, reading the media and understanding what's going on. Um, out there that um, we are looking at pretty stark um, uh, projections around unemployment. Um, it's saying in this report um, that, that Northern Ireland could see unemployment rate raised to 13%. Um, you know, when you think about in 2015, unemployment was sitting at a, at a high of 8.1% for this, whenever the new council formed. We had been very successful in bringing unemployment down the you know, half in that unemployment, not necessarily getting it in line with the Northern Ireland average. And our big commitment within the strategic growth plan is around getting it in line with the Northern Ireland average. 13% is pretty stark. We're talking in this report about economic inactivity. Um, clearly, we have a legacy here in this council area um, around economic uh, inactivity. Um, obviously, the, this will potentially increase because the sectors that are most affected are the sectors which have the lowest skills, which mean that people with the lowest skills find it much more difficult to re-enter the labour market. Um, we're focusing on, on young people. Um, a, a lot of talk about how 2020 has been a terrible year for young people, you know, uh, in terms of maybe their social lives and stuff, um, in terms of how their education, the debacle around um, the predictive grades and that type of thing and, 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 and the response to that. So the next thing for young people to face is obviously unemployment and youth unemployment, it's something which hasn't really been experienced 
in a Northern Ireland wide or a UK wide basis, um, you know, since certainly on this scale since the 80s. Um, we talked about the vulnerable sectors that are here, accommodation, obviously the hospitality industry, arts, which has been talked about in other papers, and entertainment, and then labour intensive sectors. So really what this report is about doing is, 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 is basically saying, look, we, we, we have a ring-fenced budget. Um, we would like to try to use that budget to try to work with others across a number of areas to leverage in their funding and try and do it in a more joined up basis. In the July paper, we said we were working with DFE, DFC, InvestNI, the ESF funded projects, the Northwest Regional College and the wider community sector to understand what the challenges are out there and to see how we can work collaboratively, which we had been doing anyway, obviously through the Education Skills Delivery Group and under the Strategic Growth Partnership on a number of areas. Um, we focused in this report and further reports will come on um, specific uh, interventions. The first one we've talked about is, is re-employment. We're talking here, proposing to, uh, we're working on, on a number of events, um, uh, jobs fairs, information, advice, benefits fair, um, happening in September and October um, uh, at Guildhall Square. Um, we're doing similar events with the Jobs and Benefits Office in Straban. We're also working with and proposing to work with Northwest Regional College in relation to reskilling and retraining. Um, uh, the college received funding to offer levels one to three training to those affected by COVID, either through furlough or recent redundancy. So council officers have been assisting the Northwest Regional College by consulting with those providers who work with those individuals to identify who could avail of the training and just to make sure that that training opportunity is not missed. Um, we would like to uh, allocate a budget of £20,000 uh, to, to undertake further work in terms of the gaps. I think communication is a really key one in relation to this. It's quite a difficult and um, complicated space. The amount of announcements that are coming out from government on a daily basis regarding all sorts of funding or um, outside of the skills area and within the skills arena, it can, can be quite complicated for the, the citizen and the individual to understand what's out there. So we want to be able to highlight these um, initiatives. We have had great success in the years gone by in terms of those skills academies. And those are basically around working with people who are currently underemployed, potentially, and trying to get them up that kind of skills escalator and into the jobs that actually exist. And the jobs that do exist are certainly still within the IT um, knowledge economy. Um, so we're, we, we want to engage with DFE to deliver more of those skills academies. Um, in terms of um, specific sectors, we also want to you know, look at the setting up of Construction Employment Academy in, in partnership with SAB, um, local contractors and clients across the Northwest area. Um, at the July committee, childcare was raised as an issue. So we've, we've highlighted that and looked at what we can do in terms of the childcare sector, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, looking at level four and level five within that sector itself. Um, and then obviously looking at health and social care um, itself and, and another uh, sector that was, was highlighted at the, at the last committee was around sustainability, zero waste, the circular economy and the opportunities that exist out with, within that. Um, we do have a, uh, a zero waste circular economy strategy. Um, uh, First Council um, to, 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 to publish that one of those strategies. So we want to see how can we look at the job opportunities coming out of that. So collectively we, we're proposing to ring fence around £100,000 but obviously we would, we would look at each of those individual areas, look what the where the demand is and try and work up specific proposals around that. Um, we are obviously qu quite often we are quite critical of um, the lack of FDA um, within um, the council area. We want to see more. We feel that we've got skilled people. So the one sector that we have developed a, true, a truly world-class cluster in is the fintech sector. So we we want to try to see how we, and from a Northwest perspective, can avail of the Northern Ireland offering and work with other councils, um, other the likes of Allstate and other organisations to look at a, uh, a more detailed analysis of the fintech sector and see whether there's any specific subsectors within that that we should be targeting. I think that whilst it's quite, um, you know, can be quite depressing to think about the issues in relation to COVID in terms of employment and unemployment. We do have a bright future, potentially, in the fact that we've got this established skill base with 
within the knowledge economy who can avail of the um, continued investment in the fintech sector. We're hearing jobs being announced nearly every week in that sector, um, like to see them announced here. Um, so, so we want to be able to see how can we future-proof that. And then we're also obviously trying to focus on um, that long-term unemployed, economically inactive um, cohort. Now, DFC, the, the direction of travel that we're hearing from DFC, it's, it's around trying to tackle health inequalities and that type of thing. So the area we feel that we can get involved in is around that kind of social prescribing, health hub, um, using technology type um, methodology. And, and we would like to, to, to establish a budget to be able to look at doing a pilot um, to basically join up that, um, join up all the dots around that arena. I've said already in terms of the, the difficulty in understanding the landscape, so we want to try to develop an integrated and coherent offer for young people. Um, we would normally do um, physical uh, you know, careers fairs and that type of thing, so we're going to move that online, um, to, which obviously suits young people, um, so I'm told anyway, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, being able to access them and that type of thing. So we want to be able to promote that through careers videos, develop a, a, a virtual uh, platform in, in terms of promoting careers. Um, uh, we continue to work with the City of London and we have been very, uh, we're very, very keen to, to, to move forward on that level two qualifications in terms of financial services. It goes back to that FinTech and that's engaging at an even younger age to try to basically help people in their career pathways and thinking about where are the jobs of the future going to be and try to start developing a qualification out of that. Um, so we, we want to continue with that uh, and target another 40 uh, students. Obviously that will be done on an online basis. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the whole area of apprenticeships. It's just, just to highlight, clearly there's been announcements in the last week around encouraging employers to take um, their furloughed apprenticeships back, but also to um, there's incentives there in terms of new apprentice apprenticeships that are out there. There's a lot of commentary around that. I think that we as a council, I think, have been very good um, at promoting apprenticeships as a career, as a as a pathway, and to a job. I think that that work will stand us in good stead, and hopefully will be of benefit to to, to us in the next you know, year to 18 months to two years, which it could be quite rocky. So um, the the budget around that's around £200,000. Um, uh, the recommendation is to approve the interventions that we've talked about. And obviously, as each of these projects develops, uh, we would bring back reports um, in relation to the, 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 the KPIs and their um, uh, success or otherwise. Um. Thanks, Kevin. So the first indicated speaker is Councillor Dorgan. Mary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kevin, for the very comprehensive report. And uh, I do see that you did address a lot of the issues that are, was in the lengthy discussion we had here in July. Um, I was particularly glad to see you did address the zero waste circular economy and, you know, did refer to the fact that green recovery may bring other opportunities to you. And I'm particularly interested in perhaps apprenticeships in that regard, you know, especially as a council, when we're going to be looking at the move from non-renewable to renewable sources of energy, I do think that's something that we're going to have to look at with the relevant government departments and the third level providers in terms of the new skills and new opportunities there. Uh, more generally, Kevin, uh, you referred to the, the stark unemployment forecast of 13%, and we're seeing and we're dealing and they're daily work and um, people who are facing redundancies and people that are losing their jobs, people that are finding themselves out of employment for perhaps the first time in their working lives and of course the impact that's having on their families. Uh, we know that businesses here were struggling before COVID-19 in the most challenging of circumstances and that's on the basis of the chronic neglect of this region which you referred to in your report. Also the Brexit uncertainty that we're facing uh, and in recent days, uh, we're seeing that that's becoming increasingly uh, anxious time for businesses here. Uh, so on that basis, the, the furlough scheme has been a lifeline. And now the indications that that's going to end 
on the 31st of August, that as long as well as the self-employment schemes, obviously uh, that's that's very worrying for people. And uh, we're looking elsewhere at other countries in Europe, and we're seeing Austria and France and Spain that have extended their wage subsidy schemes to 2021, and even one of them's 22. Uh, and yesterday in Stormont, this was raised. Our MLAs actually put forward a motion calling for the British government to extend the schemes before, beyond October and was glad that it got unanimous cross-party support. And I would think, I would propose that as a council, we make representations to the British government for this city and district, this region, the Northwest, which is facing so much challenges at the best of times that we really need to call for an extension of um, the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme, we need to do, all needs to be done to protect and retain jobs. And uh, it could be in a more tapered approach. You mentioned the particular sectors that are particularly vulnerable at this time. You did refer to the fact that there are other businesses and sectors that uh, are actually um, continuing to progress. But for those sectors, particularly in this area that we're seeing, such as hospitality, such as non-food, retail such as arts and culture, uh, we need uh, protection for those that uh, needs to go beyond the seven weeks time deadline that we're looking at at the minute, the cliff edge. So uh, I would propose that we write to the British government accordingly. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll second that if that's a proposal uh, in terms of writing to the uh, Westminster government. Um, uh, thanks to Kevin for the report. Um, and a lot of stuff in there, absolutely no issue with at all um, in terms of financial services, uh, in terms of the skills base that's there already and, and exploiting that. I think that's a, a key driver going forward. And in terms of Reskilling people into that sector, it, it can be done quite easily. It, it, it's, it's in terms of reskilling people from all our disciplines and the digital technology in general. It's, I mean, I did it, and thousands of others have done it in terms of all our academic backgrounds and all our skills backgrounds. So um, it's something we absolutely have to pursue. Um, and, and in terms of bringing the FDA, but also in terms of building up SMEs locally here as well. Um, a lot of stuff, as I said, we, we have no issue with. There's a couple of specific things around the unemployed and economically inactive, and I take the point about the FC around the health and the, the social prescribing. Um, in terms of widening that out, the uh, the thing from our own perspective that, that is important for the economically inactive in particular is, is almost the hand-holding in terms of the fact there's an extra resource needed, an extra time needed um, to get them to the point that we will bring them back into the labour market or get them back into the further higher education. Um, the Community Works Programme was, was run out previously through the executive and, and was very, very successful in terms of the people that it, uh, it upskilled and brought back on the employment. Uh, so from our perspective, reviving that in some shape or form uh, is, is absolutely key in terms of that sector in particular. And we'll be coming back to yourselves and, and also the department on that in terms of having those discussions uh, ourselves as a party. Um, in terms of the the idea of skills escalation, and this is a lot of it's around the targeting, or not the targeting, but the the lack of targets, in particular from training programs that will be funded by DFC, uh, you know, as well as as all our government departments and all our agencies. Um, in terms of avoiding that duplication or having people involved in program after program, you know, who are are up for it, but it's not it's missing a lot of people that should be targeting. Um, there's a very very clear need from our perspective because you talked about the amount of different funding pots that are being announced. Um, and it's like, you know, hopefully not throwing good money after bad in the sense of you, there's duplication and all of that there. So I think there's a very clear need as we, we move through this that the the training programs that are being funded, both existing and new, uh, aren't duplicating each other and, and we're using the money more wisely. And that means from our perspective that all training programs have to have clear targets, whether that's postcodes in terms of the type of people they're targeting or whether it's in terms of moving people from level two to level three as opposed to them staying on that same uh, that same sort of qualification level, which defeats a purpose. So I think that's the discussion needs to be had across the board between central government and ourselves and all our councils. Um, 
uh, what, we go back to about um, five, six years ago, there was a proposal we brought on the council about creating a jobs creation unit within the council. And at that time, there was a view that um, we weren't ready for it in terms of the capacity of the council. We couldn't do it on our own. And I think you know, retrospectively, looking back, they're, they're, they probably would share that view. The thing is now, what we're seeing is there's a lot more collaboration between ourselves and Ulster, Northwest Regional College, and hopefully more and more so with, with central government as well. So in terms of trying to crystallise the work that we've done in the last couple of years, even through the skills subgroup and the money that's been allocated to that, uh, from our perspective, there's an opportunity now, and this also involves working around social clauses and, and social value and all of that, um, that we, we take a more joined up approach and it involves Invest NI as well, of actually creating a dedicated uh, skills and job creation unit within council. That's not just council, that's actually working in collaboration with all those organisations on a formal basis, but more importantly, um, the money we've allocated here, it's money we're allocating, you know, and there may be match funding in some cases from some government departments for some of it, but there may not be. Uh, if we create a job creation and skills unit and we have a dedicated pot every year, from my perspective, the, the idea would be that we can then go to central government and others and, and have a more joined up approach in terms of allocating pots of money, uh, which will be used in, in the right way and in a more coordinated fashion. So a bit proposal from ourselves that we uh, bring a report back on the council around creating a job creation and skills unit uh, that will specifically uh, look at all of these issues um, but also have a dedicated allocation of money that can also be ring, uh, can also be uh, matched by all our relevant agencies. So that's a proposal we'd like to bring forward. Uh, and in general terms, hopefully this will start to address some of the issues. Some of this is going to be five, ten years stuff, but we have to start somewhere. So uh, we're, we're happy to propose the report, but also make that proposal as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mickey. So you seconded the paper, but can you get a seconder for your proposal yep. about the job creation skills unit? Sorry, it's your ceiling. Uh, so, Alderman Ramsey. Thank you, very, thank you very much for um, the report. And uh, obviously, the last proposal there, we support that also um, because it's another step in the right direction. Um, just as uh, regards the last proposal that sent another letter, uh, to, um, I'm just wondering, you know, why are we bypassing our MPs? And I, I would like to make an amendment to your proposal, if that's possible, mm -hmm. that we forward the letter to your MPs. Um, because they are actually the, the people who are meant to be fighting our case um, at Westminster. So a letter to Westminster, um, I just don't get it. Uh, it needs to get through your MPs. Your MPs need to know that we are looking help here and take it forward that way. So I'm proposing an amendment to the proposal, if that's possible. So your amendment is the right to the Chancellor or UK Treasury and the three MPs that represent this council area? I'll second that. That's fine. Thank you. Oh. Alderman Guy. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for that presentation. Um, obviously, reskilling and retraining now becomes vital. Uh, people just as you say, out of first time employment, uh, nothing they're accustomed to, they, they have to take uh, new opportunities when they come to them. And I just want to touch on what C Councillor Cooper says about the retraining thing. Uh, six years ago, I think he says. About six years ago now, I took two American businessmen from a city hotel to another hotel in Belfast. Now, I don't know what company they were on about, but they were sitting in the back of my car talking about they would love to set up and enhance the business here, but it looked as if they were going to have to go to Limerick simply because there wasn't the right skills base here. So that's why it's heartening to see that the, the links that have been you know, forged with uh, the, the mayor from the city of London, and they brought in uh, new qualifications and the fundamentals of financial services for schools in Strabane. I think we in this city are in a unique position to exploit ties with the world leading financial hubs in the city of London, and more should be done. I understand people don't see their future here as part of the UK, but we really need to get tied in here for the betterment and equality of all our citizens through growth and employment. And uh, 
I think that if we're going to complain about regional economy, regional economy imbalances, then I think that uh, we need to basically go and explore and forge ties elsewhere ourselves. That's everything. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Darren. And the final allocated speaker in this item is Councillor Boyle. Michaela. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. Um, um, and it's a very uh, detailed one as well, too. I'd just be keen to hear a wee bit more in terms of the setting up of Construction Employment Academy um, in partnership with the local contractors and, and I suppose those who, who have up and coming projects in the Northwest area, which, in my own opinion, is very few. Um, we um, are losing a very highly skilled team of people in regards to our builders. Um, most of our builders, um, people within construction, um, are at that age now where they are 50 plus and obviously the current crisis at the minute um, has lent its way in terms of the construction industry um, almost following the economy in terms of a collapse. Um, there'll be nothing built within the next few years, anything uh, any of the major projects, um, and that is a major, major concern amongst the, the building um, industry. Um, I don't need to inform everybody that it was uh, men and women from these islands that went to America and built America and built England, and I feel that we do very little uh, for our own um, people here in terms of the construction industry. Um, you know, they, they, they're kind of a group of people that are almost forgotten about uh, and, I, and I say that because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm closely linked to that uh, industry. Um, uh, I know the purpose of the work in terms of I think 3.11 is it where engaging with people with multiple, ba multiple barriers preventing them from taking up employment and I think that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing a lot of people in the construction industry who are, who are now had to be furloughed and maybe you know no work for them at the you know out the other end who have now had to um, make other arrangements as a very highly skilled people um, who know nothing else throughout their life only the construction industry um, who have never sat down in front of a computer um, who have never been taken an exam or anything like that so I'd just be keen to hear what what in terms of getting that sector off its feet again in terms of, um, you know, they are, some of them, it is a vulnerable sector. Um, some of them, you know, uh, from that sector do now have long-term health conditions, as is mentioned in 3.10, and maybe, you know, work-related issues, um, you know, and injuries because of the result of the work that they're doing. Uh, nobody wants a 65-year-old builder going up on their roof to, you know, fix a roof or, or, or you know, but is there, is there something in terms of the academy that we can look at maybe engaging with that sector to ensure that those uh, people of a certain generation or age now that are in that profession can help the younger ones coming forward in terms of supporting them um, and getting them into to, to roles and employment and, and training them up and skilling them up? Um, is there anything around the academies? Is that what that's involving? Or just a wee bit of information on that, Kevin? Thank you. I mean, I suppose in relation to, to the construction academy, uh, the, 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 those types of that, that, that construction employment academy, it's a, something that we've got at the, certainly the previous council, Derry City Council, through, um, through, this, through our skills team and our existing skills unit have great experience we've always we've, we've we've a great track record in terms of we we've worked on a number of initiatives which which might not be called an academy but we're about engaging with local construction companies engaging with people who were skilled um, you know looking at um, where the skills gaps exist where the barriers to re-employment re where like you know um, so from from the, from the supply side and particularly in relation to the skills uh, we've got a track record. So what this would be about would be that kind of re-engagement and kind of joining it up. Um, uh, obviously bringing in uh, the, the local training providers also and trying to, you know, 
there's a combination of signposting and showcasing what is out there. It's also, again, about, as you say, trying to understand what would be the impediments uh, to either, if you can't go back into that sector, what other sectors exist and what would be required for you to potentially feel the confidence. I think it's a lot about confidence too, to, to explore a different career pathway. So, you know, um, and, and we would like to do that with SAB. Um, there's, they've, they've developed a toolkit in this respect and we want to use best practice. So, you know, um, it's, it'll start off as a conversation and then hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll um, result in, you know, clearly defined, um, you know, pathway um, for people um, to also encourage new people into that um, uh, sector. Um, and that's what the apprenticeships is all about too. So, so it's a kind of holistic approach to lots of different initiatives that what we've been doing over the last, probably the last 10 to 15 years really when you think about it, um, notwithstanding the potential challenges around demand in terms of construction, and that's a different issue, clearly. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that we experienced post the financial crisis, the last major crisis is we did lose the majority of our skilled workforce um, and it was very difficult to attract back. Um, we were we were actually on the cusp and from 2016 onwards of starting to attract back. We saw that through our own figures. So um, we don't necessarily, I don't know if it'll, you'll see the same kind of flight because the pandemic's global um, as you had uh, um, in terms of 2009 to 2011. So we'll, we'll bring more detail back as we work it up, um, you know, so, but that's, it's more just a holistic approach to it all. Thanks, Kevin. I, I just want to ask one question. Um, you had referred in your opening remarks about this to the League's extra funding, and Councillor Cooper had referred to it as well. And I know when we had the initial paper um, two months ago that there was mention of DFC, DFE, ESF, various um, alphabet suit. Um, but can you give us an understanding? It just seems like we're paying for all this ourselves. We're 200 grand out of a, a rent payment <coughs> budget. And I know there's a DFE 39k for the IT Academy, but can you tell us what elements within that um, that there's associated funding for, from all our departments? So, I mean, Without going into every single uh, of the different uh, initiatives, um, you know, to be honest with you, the majority of these initiatives um, will be in collaboration with one or a, of all of the above. Um, and as we and as we bring back, say, say the detail around um, the skills academies or or the reskilling initiative, you know, we'll understand exactly how much Northwest Regional College are putting under that and what we're doing. So, for example, when you when you look at that, what we're talking about there as a budget to identify further gaps. That's a specific standalone budget that we're doing that they don't necessarily have the budget for. They're not funded on that basis. So what you'll understand then is what, what it is they're putting onto their side of the bargain and how we're augmenting that. Uh, the same goes for the Software Fundamentals uh, Academy. I mean, you know, the, 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 there's, there's, there's different funding uh, streams that exist out there, whether that's through Assured Skills, whether that's through specific uh, employer-led skills academies and that type of thing. So it's very difficult to detail exactly out here today how much for each of the different initiatives. You'll see that very, very clearly. Um, you know, the, the, the great thing about the partnership work that's been developed over the last number of years in terms of the strategic growth partnership and the education skills delivery group, it is, allows us to collaborate and basically also allows us to pu push them in the direction that we want them to go on from a policy perspective. We're able to tell them what the local issues are and then be bringing a small amount of money in each area, we can leverage on much more additional funding. So, you know, it's very difficult just today just to say exactly which, how much in each of those areas, but the intention is that we will do that as the, the weeks and months progress. I mean, this is an iterative, iterative process. Um, it'll develop over the next six months. Whilst there's an issue that will happen now, other ones will develop and bubble up. And basically, we want to just get the, the, the approval for the the, the general direction of travel and, and and the funding associated to that. So uh, it's a long-winded way of saying I don't know exactly. <laughs> yes, is that five minutes? Uh, th thanks for that. For, thanks for that clarity, Kevin. That's uh, 
open for the session uh, completed. So we're now moving on to open for information. So there's items 11 through 15. Would anybody like to raise any questions regarding any of them? Bear in mind Halloween is on there, item 12. Any takers? No. Sorry, just on the Halloween stuff, um, just not to rehearse what's already been said in terms of the whole um, debate, but just um, we're talking about virtual fireworks as well. So it's just to, to, to put on record that, you know, in terms of that within Straban, that, that, that if, if, we're having, if we're encouraging people to stay at home, um, and watch the fireworks, that they're at a point in Straban where they can be seen. Um, and I know one year we did have um, a position that was changed in terms of where the fireworks were let off, and there was a lot of complaints about nobody could hear or see them. So just, and, and I know I think it might be the running track is a proposed place this year, I'm not sure, but it's, as long as there's somewhere where they can be seen, if we're encouraging people to stay at home, and watch them from home, that they can be seen and heard uh, at a, a particular advantage point. Thanks. So they're definitely, well, hopefully not virtual fireworks at Halloween. They'll be very real fireworks. Um, and we do have a site identified at in Straban, and we have sites identified in the city which we won't be publishing. But we are confident that the majority of people will be able to see them um, it from their own homes. So that's what we're encouraging people to do, to stay in their own homes and gardens and communities and watch the fireworks from there. Apologies, I didn't mean virtual, <laughs> but I meant encouraging people to stay at home. Um, and no, thanks for that, because I know that is something that will be flagged up in, in the coming days and weeks ahead. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Mellon, Aileen. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just in terms of the fireworks as well. Um, I know we were discussing earlier and remember the pilot, well, the trials of the fireworks in different areas around the town. Was there any feedback from it? I know we've seen on social media around, if you've seen it, let us know and things. Um, and then also, I suppose that'll probably work out why or where they're going to be. But we did have some. Um, Concerned rather than complaints, I would say, around other areas within the town that maybe some residents didn't feel consulted and the livestock and other things weren't factored on this. So, if it's not going to be published, are they going to know about it? Uh, so, we will be publishing the, that the, fire, the time the fireworks will be, uh, will be on and the duration. So, that means that anybody who has animals or livestock or is concerned will know exactly when they're going. We weren't able to do that uh, for the trial fireworks, and we, and we sort of probably didn't do it deliberately. We did consult for, uh, you know, as widely as we thought. I know there were, were some concerns about that. This will be slightly different in that we will definitely be advertising the time of the fireworks. We just won't be saying advertising the site. Now, obviously, in and around the site, the key, the landowners and the key neighbours will be aware and, and will know that, but we won't be publishing the sites, um, mainly because we we are not encouraging anybody to gather at those sites, and we won't, will not be able to manage it if anybody does gather. So if people do think they can go to a particular site to see the fireworks this Halloween, we won't be able to proceed with the fireworks. So we're very clear about the message, the time the fireworks will be, and please watch from your own gardens or from your own front door um, or your own communities, and you know, so we'll be we'll be doing that very definitely. We will not be publicly advertising the sites of the fireworks for for very sensible reasons. Um, but the, it, the issue that we had in the summer should be uh, should be solved by the fact that people will know, and generally it's people with dogs or livestock, and what they need to know is you know the time of the fireworks so they those people will know and anybody in the immediate facility of where the actual fireworks will be will obviously be told and will be aware of it and you know we're in consultation with them on i just ask that maybe um uh, i know that it'll be whenever it's coming out that safety message of stay at home and stuff will be there that it's just mentioned on it so that people can take that into account of animals you know um 
to be considerate of them at them times or um, be aware that with any animals or livestock, it could be there and it just needs to be one sentence. But it means that because we know council did have the effort to go and consult and some people might have thought it wasn't enough, it means that you're still covering that kind of aspect of it. We will, and we would always be very careful to give that advice, particularly to, to animal owners in and around the, the times, and, and the, you know as much detail as we can give, which we, which we're confident from our from our work to date will be sufficient. Thanks, Aideen. Any other questions on Halloween? No, whatsoever. I have a proposal to go into confidential. Okay. Um, so, confidential minutes from our last.